Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and um, we'll call to order our August 13th Indian River Lagoon Council Board of Directors meeting. And we'll begin this morning uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance, if you'll please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so um, I just want to recognize that Duane, Mr. Dwayne DeFries, our illustrious leader, will not be joining us today and um, want to send our heartfelt wishes and prayers out to him. And I know that many of us have been talking to him along the way and um, rest assured he's in great hands with staff and I know he knows that and, um, and I know that he's very actively involved, but we want to send our best wishes to him. So um, I want to have all of our council members introduce themselves, and we'll start down the left with you, Chris. And good morning. My name is Chris Zadowski. I'm the current chair of the Board of County Commissioners for St. Lucie County, as well as uh, District 1 Commissioner. Good morning. I'm Jackie Thurlow Lippish, uh, South Florida Water Management District Governing Board. Thank you. Good morning, Aaron Watkins re representing the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm the director at the Central District. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Stacy Hetherington, uh, District 2, Martin County Commission and Chair. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Susan Adams, a New River County Commissioner, District 1. Yes, you are. <laughs> County Commissioner Kurt Smith from Brevard County. Danny Robbins, Volusia County, District 3. It's all of Southeast, uh, Southeast Volusia and Mosquito Lagoon. Thank you. Doug Bornique, St. John's River Water Management District. Kathy, would you like to kick it off with staff? Hi, Kathy Hill, Deputy Director. Um, sitting in today for Dwayne. And I would like to introduce our newest staff member, um, Ashley. Malcolm. Uh, Ashley comes to us with a background in uh, TV and theater, and so we're thrilled to have her. She's super good, and uh, she will be your, your sort of liaison to the meeting. She's going to be taking over meeting stuff from now on. Great. So you Welcome, say Ashley. It's a pleasure to meet everyone. Welcome. Daniel Kolodny, Chief Operating Officer. And Torsivia, Attorney. Great. Okay, well, thank you everyone. It's nice to be back and in person. And um, today we have a couple agenda revisions and then I'll be looking for a motion to approve the agenda. We have um, consent item 8B, request from Florida Department of Economic Opportunity to appoint James Stansbury, Chief of the Bureau of Community Planning and Growth to the Management Board. And our second revision is um, item 9B, request from Brevard Zoo to have um, NEP staff assist in developing an MOU to formalize the working relationship among the four Envision Restoration Centers. So um, with that, if I can move that back to the board and ask for a motion to approve the agenda. Move approval of the agenda as amended. Second. Great. Kurt, was that you that seconded it? Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Commissioner um, Smith, and all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And um, we don't have any uh, resolutions, recognitions, letters, and awards, although we always have noteworthy um, members of the organization. So we'll move on to public comment. Anybody wishing to um, provide public comment, then step forward. Seeing no public comment, moving right along, we're going to start with our water quality reports today. And um, we will start with Dr. Chuck Jacoby on the Northern and Central Lagoon. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to give you a brief update on conditions up in the central and northern part of the lagoon. Uh, we'll start with looking at secchi depths, as they're called, um, which is a way to measure water clarity. So it's a 
18th century tool that has been used by um, oceanographers and limnologists ever since. It's named after an Italian priest who invented it. And that's why most of the times you should see it capitalized because it's actually his surname. Um, so anyway, you lower this black and white disc into the water and see where it um, disappears, measure that distance. And that's about the distance that a lot of the plants need in order to get enough light to photosynthesize. So it's a very useful tool in terms of understanding how the system's responding. Um, these are data from the sampling in the field in May and June. And if you take a look, you'll see that um, up in the northern part, those, those red arrows in May and June, Mosquito Lagoon in particular, um, has the hotter colors, the red and the orange. That's lower secchi depths, so less clear water. And a lot of that is turbidity. So with the change in the seagrass coverage up in that part of the world, these, these flats where the seagrass grew, they're shallow, and they get stirred up by the wind. So that, that's been maintained, that turbidity up in that area. But if you go further down, um, you know, most of the colors are a little cooler, and that's good news. Um, it's been a relatively good year for water clarity. Um, the, on the right-hand side in the June, there's another arrow, and that relates to a galley, and I'll give you a little more information as we go through. Now I'll switch over to um, what we call our continuous monitoring devices, which are SONs, um, little data recorders that sit in the field, and then they telemeter the data in, so you can pull it down on the website. And these are the six locations that we'll talk about. So this is turbidity, which is going to be related to that secchi depth. So higher turbidity, lower secchi depth. Um, and you can see there that the Ogali, um continuous monitoring device registered in June, which is where those data came from, you know, a peak in turbidity. So, um, there's some, likewise, in Mosquito Lagoon, you can see in the blue and a little bit down at Vero as well, which is in the kind of yellow color. We we'll switch to salinity. Salinities, as um, always, vary along the lagoon. Um, that's a key part of why the lagoon is what it is, is that it has different sections that behave a little differently. So if you start at the top, both Vero and um, Mosquito Lagoon have the highest salinities. So Vero is the influence of the inlets because there's a fair concentration of exchange with the ocean down in that part of the lagoon. Mosquito Lagoon, obviously, is a long way from that. And so it's driven mostly by evaporation and rainfall. So the Salini and Mosquito Lagoon will respond to um, weather patterns, as it were. Um, then you go down, and right now um, the salinities are sort of all in the brackish to, you know, fairly saline range. But nothing extreme like we've seen in the past, where we were up in around 40 in Mosquito Lagoon and, and 45, which is what, above 35, which is seawater, and that's again the evaporation leaves the salt behind, takes the water. So we're we're in the range we kind of expect, as it were. Temperatures, it's nice out there right now in the lagoon. Um, so it's, it's certainly in the upper 80s in most places, if not in the low 90s, um, which is up from back in May when it was down around the, the 70s. And I was in there yesterday and it was pretty warm. Uh, this is chlorophyll and it's a little hard to discern um, from all the peaks, but I'll just point out a couple as we go. And that's, um, if we, well, this is dissolved oxygen and you can see that we had some issues in um, in June. Um, that's the Ogali station, the sort of maroon color. The green is probably not something that you would want to worry about. So these are optical sensors, and every now and then they get fouled. And so then the, the oxygen concentration that the machine's recording will drop. But we can sort that out by looking a little closer at those chlorophyll values. Chlorophyll is the way we look at phytoplankton, the single-celled algae. It's the pigment that they have in their cells that allows them to photosynthesize, use sunlight, and convert it to um, organic material. And you can see here that Ogali had a peak when those low oxygen levels were there. So it's that change in the phytoplankton that drives the oxygen levels in a lot of cases. So as that peak in phytoplankton dropped down, as the phytoplankton started to die, the oxygen levels tend to drop. But you don't see that. Um, in the other one, which is the green, the Banana River, where you saw those other drops. And that's because probably those are just sensor things. These are basically raw data. They haven't been processed yet. Those anomalies will be filtered out as we walk through the QAQC process. <clears throat> and then you can then, so back to the dissolved oxygen, you can see the drop there as Ogali, the chlorophyll dropped. And then you see those green drops, which really should be ignored at this point. 
Um, to get a little broader picture of, of chlorophyll values, these are chlorophyll values again from May and June from the field data. And so again, you can see that we are not seeing the orange and the red very much, if at all. And so that means we're not seeing a lot of high chlorophyll values, which is, which is good. That means the water is a little bit clearer. Um, we are seeing a, a patchy blooms. Um, we have the pyrodinium, which is the dinoflagellate, the bioluminescent that, um, dinoflagellate that everybody in, who kayaks at night loves to have around. Um, those blooms, along with diatoms, which we're also seeing, kind of take us back to the, before the 2011 stage. Those were the kinds of blooms we would expect as summer came on. Um, particularly the, the pyrodinium, the dinoflagellate. We have that, have that most every summer. Um, they don't tend to coalesce in the way that the smaller cells do, and they don't tend to make blooms that last as long. The duration tends to be shorter. They're a little larger. They don't turn over as fast. They use up material a little faster. So this is, this is in a sense, you know, good for what's going on in the lagoon. Couldn't stand up here and um, talk about the north and central IRL without talking about manatees and the issues with manatees since the end of last year. Um, so these are some statistics. Um, FWC is the kind of the state lead on this. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is involved now because it's de been declared a UME, an unusual mortality event. Um, unusual mortality events are declared based on a couple of different criteria. So if you get a certain number of manatees in a certain period of time, um, a, a rate of um, mortality above the baseline. I mean, man manatees you know, are always being injured by boat strikes or they may have cold stress. But if you get the number of mortalities climbing above that baseline, then a UME can be declared. This has been declared a UME. So that brings some other resources. It brings some other responsibilities. Um, here you can see from December to May, it was about 677 carcasses that were reported. There were 67 rescued manatees. Um, and in fact, that's where FDOC put most of their energies. They, um, you know, it was <laughs> in, still in, in COVID, they weren't all back to work. Um, so they threw most of their energy at getting the manatees they could save. So a lot of the carcasses were not necropsy, they weren't examined, so they go in as somewhat unexplained deaths rather than um, being followed up on. But uh, statewide um, on the second is 841 deaths. So there were also losses on the West Coast, some to do with red tide. Um, but our, our East Coast was the, was the highest. The previous high was um, in, in 2013, which was 830 for the year. The numbers of mortalities have dropped down now. Um, start, sort of in May, they started to go back towards the baseline. Um, the findings thus far for the bulk of the East Coast mortalities is that these manatees are underweight, about 40% underweight. Um, and, and they also see atrophy. They see um, the fact that they're basically using all their fat, some of their muscle, and even some of their organs to get energy just to stay warm and to keep rolling. So the bottom line right now looks like this UME is going to be due to starvation, which is different from past UMEs, which were due to a variety of other things, including the 2013 one. Um, but both the 2013 and the 2021, as we're calling it, um, are related to the change in the lagoon and the loss of seagrass. So back in 2013, it looks as if the shift in diet from seagrasses to macroalgae, the drift algae that we've talked about in the past a bit, some of the manatees um, developed a problem in their guts um, where there was a clostridium that produced a toxin and that gave them like a toxic shock sort of syndrome. And so those manatees looked in good shape, um, but basically you know, had a, a toxic strike. Um, whereas here, this is a longer term thing. Obviously, it looks as if these manatees have been struggling for food for a while. The UME in December kicked off when we had a cold snap. You know, December we had a bit of a cold snap. And then the second cold snap just kind of added on to that. So the manatees will huddle up where they find warm water in the lagoon that's near the Canaveral power plant. Um, and then they venture out when they're warm enough to see if they can find food. And so they had that issue of not being able to find food and trying to stay warm. So there's a lot of work going on right now um, with a range of organizations, um, US Fish and Wildlife, USGS, uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, um, us, 
and others. And looking at you know, what will be the response to this. Since it's UME, there has to be a, a report, as it were. So we have, you know, there has to be a way to tell people what happened. And um, there also are going to be short-term responses. And those are under debate. And that includes keeping this focus and expanding their ability to rescue and rehabilitate manatees. So right now, the rehabilitation centers are basically full. Um, and so they're trying to expand that base to um, be able to hold more manatees. And they're finding that you know when they get calves, because if the mother dies, you have an orphan calf. And an orphan calf is a two-year commitment um, because they need to be raised for two years before they can be released to the wild again. So that's a, that's a significant commitment of resources. But there are also talks about provisioning. Um, is there something that we need to do to help manatees with the coming winter? Um, is there a way that we can get them food so that they can have you know, warm water and food? Um, that, that has a range of issues surrounding it, including the fact that the Marine Mammal Protection Act says you can't feed a threatened species. And so we need to you know, find a way to see if we can get around that issue. Medium-term responses, they're working on you know, how can we increase forage? Um, you know, you know, are there other, are there things that we can put out there that manatees could use as food? as well as access to warm water. So some of the access to some of the springs and so forth have been reduced, and you know, that's a warm water refuge, and that's what kind of manatees need is a little bit of both of those. Um, longer term responses, there's a recognition that this is a slightly different problem from increased boat strikes or cold stress. Um, this is a systemic problem. This is a problem with the way that the system's functioning. And so there's a push then to understand the implications of this for the population. What does this mean in the long run for manatees? As well as there's a big push to find ways to help you know, get the lagoon back on its feet. So lagoon harbors at any given time, um, there's about 4,000 manatees probably on the east coast. And the lagoon has harbored up to 2,000 plus of those at any given time. So it's a, it's a major um, stopping off point, as it were, as manatees move up and down the coast. And I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, go ahead, Doug. Morning, Chuck. Morning, Doug. Um, the manatee population you just mentioned, is, is it from 10 years or 20 years ago, is it trending, it's obviously trending down from your data? No, um, the manatees actually were um, moved from endangered to threatened because the population had risen. That's what I thought. Yeah. So, you know, the issue is that um, what, is, what will this do? What will this sort of threat do to those um, estimates of where the population's headed? And the challenge with that is that you need to have, you know, some period of data because the population models, the way that you predict how the population will respond, it's based on the survivors. Um, so you need to follow who survived and how many of those manatees survived. And so that will take a little time. And on the Seki disc uh, slide, you mentioned that the, the grass beds of the extreme North Lagoon uh, were all diminished or all gone. Why, what's the number one reason that they're gone? So, I mean, the number one reason we've lost seagrass is, are the phytoplankton blooms that we've had. So starting in 2011, um, then we had 2012, and that, that was up in Mosquito. Um, then we had a, a little bit of a period of time where seagrass has actually rebounded in sort of 13, 14, which is a little bit like what we're seeing right now in terms of clarity. And then we had the, um, the 16 blue, which was the, the brown tide that caused the fish kill. And then a 17, 18 blue, and, um, and a sort of 19 bloom. So, you know, it's just been a repeated series of these blooms that um, reduce light and the timing, the fact that they often occur relatively early. So as the growing season begins, rather than late as the growing season's ending. And, and that's what's been driving most yeah, of the seagrass loss. I knew that, I just, would you say that septic tanks are the cause of- <laughs> how, how do you go all the way back? Nutrients are the ultimate, you know, yeah. I mean, that's the driver is um, um, nutrients in the lagoon. So, you know, again, the lagoon is a special place partly because it has these long residence times in places like Mosquito Lagoon mm -hmm. or Banana River Lagoon or the upper part of the IRL. Um, and it's those long residence times, you know, drive that ecology. So the things that you see as being special are also very fragile, as it were, or vulnerable. And so, you know, when you get nutrients in that system, they stay for years in some cases. Um, and, and that's what we're fighting, um, is yeah. this buildup. 
And so again, you know, all the things that people are, are doing is you know, trying to reduce those loads and get the loads that are in there out so that we can reduce the amount of blooms. Well, I was going to have blooms, and you don't want to get rid of blooms. They drive the productivity. I mean, blooms are the base of the food web. Um, but what you don't want to do is exacerbate the durations and the intensities. You don't want the blooms to not have as much light for as long. And that's where we're going to go. So. Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Chuck, I've been watching these manatees come and go for 20 plus years. And I have a strong suspicion that, and I'm no scientist, so I don't have any documentation, but I have a strong suspicion that all these warm water outflows that we've created with power plants have caused an awful lot of these manatees to lose their natural migration instinct. And they gather in these areas, and if we have a prolonged cold spell, they wind up dying there because there's no food source there. Uh, in fact, I know for a fact that there have been necropsies on those animals where they have rocks and mud in them in their guts because there's no food in those pockets. How much of an influence do you think that has had on the death total of these manatees? Because some people have told me there's thousands of acres of seagrass down south. And if these manatees were naturally going down south, they would discover that. And we've kind of programmed that out of their system. So what are your thoughts? Am I way off base or, or am I thinking somewhere along the lines of reality? No, part, part of the discussions, and again, uh, FWC is, is the source of, you know, the base of information on manatees, along with USGS. But um, part of the discussion is the fact that manatees are creatures of habit. So calves learn from their mothers where to go when it's cold and where to go to find food. And so definitely, and there, you know, there is discussion about what are the trade-offs of keeping to these warm water sources, man-made warm water sources, what are the trade-offs in terms of the population? And this situation will bring all that to the fore. You know, what, what, how can we shift from, because, you know, they were endangered. I mean, you know, they're kind of on the cliff. So, you know, everybody said, well, we'll do whatever we can to make sure that we can get them off the edge of the cliff. You know, now we need to go back and say, what do we, what do we need to do in the long run? And um, maintaining those warm water sources may not be a key part of that equation. So, but, you know, I mean, again, you, you get a situation and you got to deal with it. So, Jackie. The, uh, was it 677 manatees? Is that from Volusia to, is that the entire East Coast? Uh, or? 677, I believe, was the East Coast, and it was the whole East Coast, from recollection. I'd, I'd have to double right. check. I looked a while back, but I don't remember. Is is was the were the majority of them in where were the majority of those deaths and were they equal in the south or was it mostly in the north? Um, the majority of the east coast death, deaths have been in Brevard County um, because that's where you find the majority of the manatees most of the time. Um, but as the conditions as the water became warmer, um, the deaths started to move north and south. Uh, um, and so some of the thinking is that the manatees that were struggling, you know, went to find food, as was pointed out, you know, go south, there might be, there's food down there, um, but they didn't have the wherewithal to make it, so. So most of them stay in the north, or they stay at Cape Canaveral? A, a lot of manatees hover, you know, there have been recorded up to 2,500 manatees around that Canaveral power station, so, mm -hmm. which is probably about a half of the East Coast population, wow. so. If it's cold enough, they'll be there. Right, it's so tragic. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Dr. Jacoby, for that report. And we will move on to our next water quality report, which will be the Southern Lagoon with Diane Hughes from Martin County. Good morning, welcome. Which buttons am I? <coughs> I think you all know who I am, so we'll move to the next slide. Oh, what happened? Is that okay? So, this is showing you where Lake Okeechobee is right now. Uh, yesterday at 1409 feet, and we 
currently don't have any flows coming out of the S80 or the S308, and we haven't since April 10th. So that's good, and the estuary is starting to look good in that condition that we have. Diane, it's a little hard to hear you. So. Pardon me? It's a little hard to hear you. Oh, okay. I'll get closer to um, <clears throat> You can see what our mid-estuary salinities are doing. Um, they were looking good for a, a while up here. In May and July, we started getting some rain coming down. This is all from local basin runoff for the salinity moving down. And we've had no Lake Okeechobee discharges, so it's all our local basin runoff. The enterococcus levels in the um, Indian River Lagoon and our mid-estuary are looking good. We haven't had any even medium values uh, since July 6. Anecdotal and observations that we have. Um, staff have been going out in the field. They've been seeing clear water, but they're seeing a smaller plume coming out through the inlet from C24, C23, 24, and 25 in our local basin runoff. They are seeing some seagrasses, very sparse, small seagrass coming in on the sandbar. And um, bait fish, conch, manatees, dolphins, and stingrays have been seen in within the Indian River Lagoon and estuary. Our biggest concerns right now is there's a harmful algal bloom on the lake, um, so we don't want any see any discharges. We're finally in the rainy season. And the core will be discharging just from the C44 basin, um, actually when the, when not the lake level, when the canal level changes bottom number, it reaches 14.5. That shouldn't have said the lake, it should have said the canal level reaches 14.5. C44 canal is currently at 14 feet, so it's likely for us to get um, some water this weekend that'll be headed its way to the Indian River Lagoon and probably out the inlet. We just don't want, no, we gotta see what rainfall comes to us. I believe that's my last slide. Yep. Any okay. questions? Anybody have questions for Diane? All right. Mine's always shorter than Great. Chuck's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Diane. Okay. Moving on to our management conference committee reports. We're going to start this morning with um, our management uh, report by Kathy La Martina, the chair of that committee. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning. Is this one up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Well, the management board held their first in-person meeting in quite a while this past Tuesday. It was really nice to see everybody's faces with masks on, but we saw each other anyway. Um, we, uh, we approved the minutes from the last meeting that we had of May 11th, and our finance subcommittee report um, was accepted unanimously by the management board, but there was not a quorum with the subcommittee, uh, but they did approve it to be sent to the management board. We did have two presentations. One was one that you're going to see in a little bit um, about the aquarium project. That was very exciting and extraordinary, and we're very excited about that. And uh, we did see the pres a presentation from FWC on the manatees, which Chuck just summarized for you folks. Um, our actions relating to the business agenda um, include uh, we had an update on the geo collaborative. Um, DEP innovation grant from Dan um, on uh, regarding the fiscal year 2023 RFP categories and financial allocations for the FY 2023 budget that was approved unanimously by the board. Um, the fiscal year 2021 final budget amendment was uh, approved unanimously by the board. The fiscal year 2022 budget amendment was approved unanimously. Um, and the, uh, let me see, that was the last action that we had to do. Um, so we did have an update on the projects from Dan and the communications and then actually the new license plate from Kathy. And I just wanted to personally let the folks know in Martin and St. Lucie County that I will be reposting a new solicitation for the Indian River Lagoon license plate grant that our district 
uh, administers for Martin, St. Lucie, and Palm Beach County. It was under solicitation in July, but we did not receive very many applications, and the applications that we did receive um, were incomplete, so they had to be rejected. So that will be coming out in the next week or two. So if anybody has any questions relating to them, please give me a call, and I'll let you know because we really want to get that, that funding put out there. And uh, that's about it for me. Does anybody have any questions? Questions for Kathy? Okay, great. See Thank none. you. And we have our STEM Advisory Committee report by Dr. Chuck Jacoby again. So yes, we met on Tuesday as well. Um, we did not reach a quorum. It was a, our first face-to-face -face as well. Um, but we did discuss several of the issues, and so I'll bring that to you. Um, before I go on, though, I should mention that uh, the recent surveys of seagrasses have shown some in the south and um, a little bit poking up in the calerp up in the north, so it's encouraging. Uh, let's see, so we um, did discuss the minutes, there were no changes. We had four presentations. Um, one was on manatees, which you got the summary of, the aquarium, which you'll hear, which was great. Um, ferrite treatment of um, the dredge spoil. Um, it was a, was a very interesting presentation, and I gave a brief update on progress with the HAB task force, or the Red Tide task force, depending on how you want to label it. Um, and in terms of business, yeah, we were, and there was no worries about the way the RFP is going to be put out, so. Okay. Yes, Aaron. Can you give me just a super quick synopsis of the dredge spoil uh, presentation, what that was about? And Sure. So, you know, the concept um, of shifting from navigational dredging to environmental dredging means that you have to worry a lot more about the water that you put back into the system because that can be where some of the nutrients you're trying to get out of the system will be. So, you know, you bring up the, the muck with a lot of water because it's a hydraulic process, but, and the, the water that you process out so that you can transport the somewhat dry muck, um, that's the concept is to treat that to remove the nitrogen and phosphorus, and ferrate is one way to do that. They're actually treating the muck now itself before it goes into the geotextile tubes to be um, allowed to dewater, and then the water is cleaner and can be put back without so much concern. But that's a big shift in terms of thinking from navigational dredging to where you're mostly worried about the solids to the environmental dredging. And the ferrate process is a chemical process, um, converts at the right sort of pH and so forth, converts the nitrogen compounds to gas, nitrogen gas, which you know goes into the atmosphere and is not bioavailable and tends to bind the phosphorus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So is this a process they're exploring? Have there been any pilots that have used this process? Yes, there have. And um, you know, again, it's a, I think that the primary issue was a scaling issue. So the, the thing about the ferrate is that it doesn't keep and transport very well. So you kind of have to produce it on the spot. And so that's what they've done is, is create a sort of a trailer system where they create the ferrate and put it into the dredge as it comes up. Okay, Chris. Uh, Chris. Virginia's here, she's got the scoop, so. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, we are, I was gonna save this from my report, but uh, the St. Louis County has moved forward with our Taylor uh, Creek dredging. Uh, we did it once before, and as part of it, we do a hydraulic dredge, and we actually create a singular uh, tube that runs from the Taylor Creek uh, weir all the way up back up through the Fort Pierce Farms and into a, a canal, which then goes into our spoil site. The spoil site then accepts the material, the muck and, and the water, etc., and then it flows through as the water dissipates from the sand and the muck, and it goes through several chambers before it actually goes to an STA. Once it gets into the STA, the nitrogen and phosphorus and other contaminants begin to be removed. And the water on the outside, the back end of it, is so much clearer uh, that actually you could probably drink it. I mean, it's, it's incredible at the, at, the, at, the, at the cleanliness of this, this STA. And then it's then placed back into the, the canal and sent back to the lagoon as, as clean water. So uh, we're very proud of it, and, and it might be something that we study that, uh, from the standpoint of the NEP, uh, maybe even have someone you know, uh, check it out and see how it's working. 
but it was well worth the investment that we made, uh, some several million dollars for the spoil site, uh, and we continue to actually be able to do that. We're hoping to be able to move that forward in a municipal services uh, boundary unit for the uh, elements that are there, Harbor Point, uh, Harbor Town, Marina, uh, Cracker Boy, et cetera, so that we continue to make sure that those those muck uh, sediments are removed from the lagoon and not pushed back out into the, one of the largest uh, seagrass flats that we have in the, in the, uh, in the lagoon uh, right there at Fort Pierce Inlet. So just wanted to share that. It's, it's a pretty incredible operation. They're putting together the pipe now. It becomes one singular rubberized pipe about this big, and it's pretty amazing. So. That's very interesting. Anybody else? Okay. Great, and then we have the Citizens Advisory Committee, and Kathy, you're gonna give that report today. Yes, Captain Catino sends his regrets. He had a charter this morning, so he couldn't make it. Um, so CAC met yesterday. Uh, they did not have a quorum. So again, people were a little afraid of coming together during COVID still. So um, they, it was lightly attended, but well attended. Um, they uh, recommend through consensus, they couldn't vote obviously, but they had a consensus of those present that they would like to approve the budget amendments or recommend that you approve the budget amendments. Um, the selection of the auditor, um, we gave them the license plate, the new license plate art to look at, which you'll all get to see today. Um, when, I, when we did the briefings with some of you, you didn't get to see that, but because we didn't have it yet, uh, but I have it now and you'll see that later. So <laughs> they were excited about that and I hope you will be too. Uh, and then probably the most important thing they did yesterday was we asked them uh, for purposes of um, designing the RFP for education and outreach that you'll be seeing later, or you'll be voting on later the amount, uh, just how they wanted to construct that. Did they want to do a directed call or did they want to have people just bring their best ideas? And they kind of decided, and it was a little bit surprising, they wanted to have a directed call. And so we'll be bringing that forward um, in, the, in the next meeting. Uh, for that, and we'll be putting those RFPs out in November. And that is pretty much it. Great. Any questions for Kathy? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. And we approved the appointment of James Stansberry in our agenda earlier. And we'll move on to presentation. So we have the additional item, which Madam is Chair, yes. We we need a vote for the consent agenda. Oh, we, we didn't approve the agenda and the consent agenda. You, you approved agenda. the agenda okay. revision. Now you need to vote on Always, consent. Always. I'm between you and Glenn. We'll track me down if we need to. So, um, Council, we need a, a motion to approve the consent agenda with the additional item appointment of James Stansberry. Move approval as amended. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Zadowski, seconded by Commissioner Adams. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, so our additional item, request from Brevard Zoo to have the uh, NEP staff assist in developing the MOU to formalize the working relationship among the four restoration centers. And who's gonna give that presentation, Kathy? Ashley? Thank you. I hope that the uh, request for the MOU help will be my punchline at the end. Great. Um, Good morning. And then so. please state your name for the record. Yep. I'm Keith Winston. I'm the executive director of Brevard Zoo. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as you know, I've been making the rounds going to the different parts of the NEP making this presentation. And when I started on Tuesday morning, it was really great because a couple of people in the audience came up and said, hey, I'm really interested in finding out what's going on with the aquarium. It's a great way to kick it off. And standing here today, I have to say two of our champions, Commissioner Smith and Commissioner Adams, are also on the board. So I feel exceptionally welcome. They've been working with us on this project. Um, and I really love this opportunity to share with you what we've been working on, some of the changes that have taken place after our COVID year. Um, so with that, can I advance it, Kathy? Or you okay, fantastic. I can, yeah, if you got the clicker, that's easier. Um, tell you about what we've been doing the last couple of years putting this project into place. So first, a couple things to start off with. If you're not familiar with us, Brevard Zoo, actually, we work under the umbrella of the East Coast Zoological Society of Florida. Um, and it includes the zoo as well as the Sea Turtle Healing Center and Treetop Trek. We're about 37 years old, 27 years old, open. Um, and we've 
it's consistently punched above our weight. I hope you've all been there. If not, I invite you to. We make national lists of best zoos all the time because we're sort of uniquely of the community. The community built us. Nearly 16,000 plus people built us, and we feel like we take that legacy very, very seriously. Um, we're recommended and we're sort of recognized across the board from our conservation work to our education work to our exhibitry. And one of the things we're really proud of is we are completely independent economically. We're a 501c3. We don't get any recurring operating support, but we are lucky enough to get a piece of the bed tax in Brevard County. Um, so any of you who don't live in Brevard County, and anytime you stay with us in Brevard County, thank you. We get a little piece of that. We're very excited about that. Um, despite the challenges the port has had recently in terms of cruising, uh, tourism is up in Brevard County, and all these new hotels are coming in. And every time I drive by a new hotel site, I try to estimate the number of rooms and the new income coming to the zoo. Um, we like to think we return the favor uh, by driving tourism in our county, by giving people another reason to come, and we do, and we survey quite a bit. Um, we have a very unique philosophy of conservation, and when you look at zoos across the country, and this is really it, I mean, we really use, I don't know, if I point up here you won't see it, but we really try to answer the call. Um, we work with researchers, scientists, agencies, and it all started quite a few years ago when both the federal and the state folks who work with Florida scrub jays came to us and said, we have a problem. We need to learn how to translocate scrub jay families from sort of endangered properties that are being you know, destroyed to places they can thrive. And interestingly enough, when they first came to us, I was sitting with my director of animal programs, we instantly knew how to solve that problem because zoos across the world have been working on wildlife projects like this for years. If you know about scrub jays, they live in these social groups with adults and helpers. And we knew from working with um, golden lion tamarins in Brazil and with wolves, you need to move the whole family. And at that time, they were only moving the helpers. So we were like, we can, we can help with that. Um, so we started on that project. We became experts on translocating scrub jays. And I just found out this week, for the first time, we actually have funding to support that effort. We've typically done that on our own dime. And that's something else that makes us unique. We can generate our own income, and I'm going to come back to that. We've since worked, I'm going to look at my list because I'll forget things, with Perdido Key beach mice up in the panhandle, with four species of sea turtles locally, diamondback terrapins, where we've actually helped work with the state to do the population modeling, uh, Florida grasshopper sparrows, which is probably the most endangered breeding bird in North America. Uh, we're working with that project to bring back the grasshopper sparrows. Florida black bear, we do rehab. And West Indian manatees, which you've talked about today. And I want to use this as an example of how we respond. Right now, we don't do a lot with manatees. We are actually the people they call when there's going to be a release of a rehab manatee in Brevard County. We literally show up with tons of bodies, and we help move the manatees. And our director of conservation project shared with me yesterday, she found something recently at her father's house, a picture of her as a little girl with what she wants to be when she grows up. And it actually showed a SeaWorld manatee team releasing them. She's like, oh my gosh, we actually do that. Um, but here's how we respond to answering the call. We are not manatee experts. And, and uh, Chuck, I think, very eloquently talked about the challenges right now with manatees and what's going to happen this winter and what's going to happen with, when they go to these warm weather sites. But we are ready to answer that call. So if the call came that we need to do provisioning for manatees, if the researchers said there's a very specific way we have to feed them to get them done, we've already said we're ready. We will get you hundreds of volunteers, if not thousands of volunteers. We are on a Duda and Sons lands, which is one of the largest farming families in the country. And in LaBelle, Florida, they grow a tremendous amount of lettuce. So we would try to broker that deal and figure out if there's a way we can provide lettuce at a cheaper rate, we're ready to answer that call. But we don't make those decisions on our own. We respond to the experts. Um, then there's a lot of conversations going on if this is even a better way to be. So anyway, just want to frame that up for you. That's how we answer the call for wildlife. We also focus on community sustainability. And most of all, we focus on the Indian River Lagoon. And the same story comes through. Um, we started with Linda Walters, who's at UCF, fantastic researcher. She was developing techniques that worked in the Mosquito Lagoon very specific problems with the oyster reefs up there. And we literally answered the call from Linda Walters to the Nature Conservancy to us to provide the human dimension backbone of making hundreds of thousands of oyster mats. From that expertise, we started working in Brevard County. Um, we've, I think, grown the largest oyster gardening program in the world where people grow oysters off their docks. They get incredibly engaged with the lagoon this way. They treat their oysters as little babies. Um, the Shuck and Share program, and again, we, we work with other folks. That program originally came out of Volusia County, a fantastic program, Marine Discovery Center. We play the same role in Brevard. Um, 
tremendous amount of oyster reef work with the SORA program. Virginia's here. Do you know how many, what our total length today is? I know we did over half a mile last year. Yeah. Um, the plan eventually is to do 20 mile of restoration in Brevard County, and we're the primary agent for that. We've piloted with seagrasses up in Merritt Island, and we want to develop expertise there. And recently, we picked up the Super Clam Project, um, which was something that was piloted with Captains for Conservation, University of Florida, and essentially we said, yeah, we can help. We're doing 100 clam gardens this year. So again, we answered the call for the lagoon. We found ourselves suddenly working in marine environments quite intensively. And the NEP's been a big helper. These are some of the projects you've supported. Often our pilots start with your funding, so thank you for allowing us to develop those skills. So where does that lead us? That leads us to the aquarium. We realized about six or seven years ago that there was this huge vacuum on the east coast of Florida. There's no major aquarium south of Charleston. Um, there are aquariums on the west coast of Florida. You have a bunch of marine experiences in Orlando, but this I-95 corridor was wide open for our model. Um, and we started looking around and we looked at multiple sites in Port Canaveral, and we found this incredible 14-acre site I'll show you in a minute that is ideal for this. Um, we also know that what we do at the zoo, and I think you've all been there, is we provide these uniquely interactive experiences that connect people with habitats, and what a better site than on the Banana River. Um, and we wouldn't be looking at this if it didn't follow our model. Um, I'm a money numbers guy, ultimately. My job is to provide the resources for my folks to do the work. I wish I could do the work. It's a lot more fun to actually carry manatees. But I do the spreadsheets, as I suspect some of you do up here. Um, and I started running multiple models. And every time we ran it, it ended up showing that fact that if we built an aquarium in this area, we would be able to spin off significant funds for Indian River Lagoon restoration. And that was our initial drive um, to do that. We also would do a lot of other things for our community that are really, really incredible in terms of driving tourism, in terms of um, bringing in, uh, sort of attracting the human capital that our aerospace folks need. Um, but we wanted a place, I keep going back and forth between the analogy, and maybe you guys can help me clarify. You know, if you take a look at the history of the Inimur Lagoon, we've had these ups and downs of awareness in our community of the needs. So back in the 80s, the direct sewer you know, flows were stopped, and I think the team back then thought, hey, we've solved it. Now we have a whole different set of problems. And I hope we can solve these, but I can guarantee you the one thing we know is that the next set of problems will show up. So I keep going back and forth on this analogy. Is the aquarium going to be a firehouse on the lagoon, ready to put out the new fire, or a lighthouse on the lagoon, constantly shining a light that we have to protect this resource? If you look at the world today from a, a zoo person point of view, that we look internationally, one of the things we love to say is there is no wild left. We have to manage everything. As much as we might have this romantic vision, we're going to have to manage the Indian River Lagoon forever if we want to keep it in a condition we like. So the aquarium gives us that place to do this. This is the site I'm talking about. Um, if you're driving in, um, it's hard to direct this, but from left to right on your image, that's 528 coming from I-95. Um, it turns down into Cape Canaveral and then the city of Cape Canaveral and then Cocoa Beach. Um, if that intersection sort of in the middle, right to the right of the yellow area, that's where if you go to the port and you go to grills, that's where you go. You turn, you go into the cove area. Um, uh, the exploration tower is on your upper right. The red area is a, a fringe that we would, a mangrove fringe that we would manage as part of this. The white area is this incredible mangrove forest with canals in it, which great fishing right off it. Um, the yellow area is the area we're talking about. It is a, it's actually a poorly surveyed site, somewhere between 24 and 26 acres, depending on how you survey it. Um, and we're currently working with the port to lock up 14 acres of it. We'd like to lock up the whole site for our restoration piece. But this is ideal. You literally can drive over from Orlando, drive from I-95, come in into the port, turn into the aquarium, essentially. It's perched on the Banana River. Um, and just south of there is a rookery site uh, for, you know, for wading birds. And this whole cove, as we've been exploring this idea, and Dwayne and I were talking about this last week, we see this whole cove as potentially a giant seagrass nursery. From our little bit of experience with seagrass, you need a lot of volume, and obviously you need to keep out manatees in the initial pieces. It's so shallow, ironically, you have to keep them out. It's so shallow that manatees can't get in there. And, and that is one of the problems right now. We can't, you know, we're, again, we're not a manatee expert, but we can't respond to the current crisis of manatees by by throwing out acres of seagrass. We don't have that capability. And one of the things I'll talk to you about at the end is these four restoration centers and the request for the MOU 
But together with planning, the four of us could really start to address that problem. So that's the site. Here's an image. This is the fun stuff. I'm only showing you a couple of images today. This is what it looks like from the water side. Um, in the upper right is a big building. That is the conservation hub. That is an open part of the aquarium that's free to get into, that has meeting rooms, classrooms, a great Wi-Fi backbone for researchers who are doing work in the port in that area. One of the things researchers told us is, please, can you build a shower and changing room? I bring students down. And then we got a three-hour drive home, and we're disgusting, and we want to change. It sounds so mundane. My development director says, stop telling that story. It's just so practical. I said, but that's the point. It is so practical. It's what the needs are. Um, we were talking at one of the meetings earlier this week. You know, one of the things we want to do in that particular building is sort of reflect the latest science coming out of the research institutions up in Nana Lagoon. But a fantastic suggestion was made to me. But actually show how that's changing how we manage the lagoon. Because one of the problems we all know is that people don't understand the difficulty of this. And people come in, why bother? Why are you doing research? Just fix it. Well, we need the research to fix it. So this is an open science place. You'll see as you look at this image, it reflects Brevard Zoo's actual model. Um, it's got a covered boardwalk that goes around. It doesn't look like your traditional northern aquarium. It's not a big concrete box or a big metal box. I don't think a tourist coming here from Baltimore wants to spend their time inside the whole time. They want to have a different experience. So it's a loop with a covered walkway with indoor and outdoor pavilions. I'm going to talk about a few of them. And you'll notice how much of it is actually on the water, right? So that whole boardwalk area on the water is a bunch of pavilions where we get to highlight the restoration work we all do in the Native Lagoon pull oyster habitats out of the water, have kids plant a mangrove, actually engage them directly in fun ways that keep them activated. Um, Chuck was talking earlier about the monitoring stations we have in the lagoon. The big dock that you see, we want to actually feed. We have some great technologies here that are giving us water quality, but it's really hard unless you're a scientist to look at a, a dissolved oxygen reading from somewhere else. However, if those sensing devices are actually right out there and they're marked in the water and you can understand Oh, look, that site right there. Here's what the water temperatures is. It's beautiful and clear, and here's what we're learning about um, the, you know, chlorophyll and all those other things. One of the most elegant examples of that I've seen is actually in the East River in New York City. They have a big, giant cross, and when it's safe to swim, because the E. coli count is low, it lights up green. And when it's not safe to swim, it lights up red. I thought it was just such a simple communication. And growing up in New York, I would never think anyone's swimming in the East River. So progress is possible. Um, so examples of those sorts of communications. Um, the campus itself, obviously it's an aquarium. I'm going to show you a few of the types of experiences that we start with. One of the things we always start with with the zoo is people trust us. If we do one thing right, we have to do that thing right, and that is take care of our animals. So the first thing we want to show, it's a little untraditional, we're going to be talking about sort of three themes here, um, is our sea turtle, how we care for them, and our sea turtle healing center. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see there's a picture of actual treatment going on. In the middle is rehab. And on the left will be some animals that can never be returned. In the middle, you'll see there's a screen overhead. Our joyous moment is when we get to send a sea turtle home, which means release it. Um, and I heard an amazing stat from our vet this week, which I didn't realize. I mean, we see hundreds of turtles every year. A lot of them don't make it. A lot of them come in too rough to make it. But of all the turtles we've rehabbed over seven years, only one, after they're healthy and can stabilize, has not gone home. There's only one turtle we haven't ever been able to solve its buoyancy issues. It will never be able to make it in the wild, and it's gone to an aquarium. But every other turtle has gone out. Turtles that have missing fins, turtles have all sorts of things. They're really tough animals if you give them a chance. So this is one example of the type of experience people will go. The aquarium itself will actually focus on three different key habitats and four sort of messages. And those habitats are the habitats that, you know, essentially define our counties. The Atlantic Ocean, the Indian River Lagoon, and the St. Johns River. And we've got to remember those three things end up working together in one way or another. So those are the stories we tell. And there's sort of four conservation themes that will run through the institution. Um, uh, sustainability in terms of sustainable plastics and how we address those issues. Sustainable fisheries. We want to talk about commercial fishing. We work closely with the Thompson family um, in Brevard County. We want to talk about commercial fishing. We want to talk about sports fishing. We work with sports fishermen. Living with the lagoon as a main focus for the average person and household in any of our region, um, and then becoming a lagoon warrior, like I hope all of you are, I assume all y'all are, because that's a whole different thing, right? How do we get involved? Those four themes will come through. Um, 
We talked about different places. We'll talk about the beach, and we'll talk about the lagoon, and anyone want to guess? We're not going to have marine mammals. We might have a marine mammal rehab facility, but we're not going to have dolphins or manatees on display here. They're right out there, right outside of our doorstep. Most popular animals in, in, uh, in aquariums? Anyone want to venture a guess? Sharks. Sharks, of course. Um, and uh, I have to tell you, the way we're going to display sharks is very different than everybody else. Um, my son's still an avid fisherman. When we first moved here, we started fishing. I remember the first time Wade fishing in the lagoon, and I saw a dorsal fin cut through the water, and we realized it wasn't a dolphin. It was a big bull shark, and it was coming our way. And that's a life-changing experience. It gets a little respect. And so we wanted to recreate that for visitors, because as you know, the lagoon's an amazing nursery for bull sharks. Very different than going to see a shark in a, in a tunnel. Um, so this is Shark Flats. This is one of our experiences. It's outside. We get to borrow the landscape on the actual lagoon. We're going to work to make it a little more intimate so you really feel like you're walking through the middle of these sharks. And, and we're having some ongoing arguments with our design consultants because we really want to do bull sharks on one side, a really tenacious shark, but what's actually here in numbers in the lagoon um, and a fascinating story, and lemon sharks on the other side, which are found in profusion off the Cape. That's not your typical sharks you see in every aquarium, but that's who we are and that's what we'd like to do. Um, another experience here is the St. John's River. And, you know, we're Florida, we're year-round, we want you to get your feet wet, literally. Um, so some of the experiences here you'll actually be, have an opportunity. There's a high road. If you look in the very top, you can keep your feet dry. Um, but if you want to get wet, you can. Accessibility is a huge part of our zoo, so we would offer special wheelchairs you can transfer to that are wet friendly. And this is not the only place you can get your feet wet here. Um, so these are just a few of the experiences we're talking about. Um, impact, over half a million people a year will come easily. I think that's a dramatic underestimate, but we'd rather build our models very conservatively. Um, fun restoration projects. We have committed a dollar of every paid admission to go to you, to actually go to the NEP. About half a million dollars a year is what we think we'll spin off to you once we're up and running. Um, dramatically improve our ability to do restoration work. We'd love to get the other 10 acres and have a, some significant nurseries, whether it's if we go for oysters or clams or seagrass or mangroves, have that ability to engage people in that. Um, bring do dollars and jobs to the Space Coast, probably about 900 to 1,000 jobs will spin off, not your immediate concern, but it may be important to Commissioner Smith. Um, and um, and a, probably about $100 million of economic impact. Human capital, the Space Coast is that, and our aerospace companies, their biggest challenge is addressing um, and, and recruiting enough engineers. We happen to know that engineers love aquariums, so it's really good for that. And a center of Camorra's community pride. I mean, we're all trying to take this issue and, and manage it and solve it, and we need to celebrate our successes, and the aquarium is a chance to do that especially in Brevard County, but I think for the whole lagoon is something to be proud of. So where do we stand in the process? Our last cost estimate we did in the fall before the construction prices went up and it was 85 million, and I've told the same story. I don't want to do another cost estimate right now. I want to wait a few months and see if the price of materials drops. As you all know, it's through the roof. But call it an 85 to $100 million project. Much cheaper than if we built a big box aquarium, by the way. Um, they are building a big one on I-75, Moat Marine is moving, that's $130 million, and they're doing the sort of the big box approach. Um, we are waiting, we have two other hurdles we need to pass before we actively start to fundraise, but right now, before really asking any individuals for money, we're over $30 million. Uh, the TDC in Brevard County has committed $10 million, the state has committed money, but the rest of that is private money. $20 million has come in without us asking anybody for money at this point. Um, so we have a little more fundraising to do, but that'll kick off when we have a final agreement with the port, which we hope will happen. I think we're on track now for September. We'll know very soon. Um, and we'll start construction when we have 90% of the funds committed. So I'm hoping three years from now I'll be telling you we got a shovel in the ground. Or earlier, if any of you want to write a check, any other counties would like to support us. We could go faster. We'd love to do that. Um, so we're really excited about that possibility. I also thought this was great. Our, our campaign is called the Legacy Campaign, uh, Protecting Our Natural Resources, Transforming Our Future. It is an ambitious, transformative campaign. We worked with an outside designer, and this is one of the images they picked. We didn't even have to mention seagrasses. They just showed up. Um, so we were really excited that, it, obviously, the verbiage communicated something really critically important there. 
And I will tell you that last year the zoos changed its mission. Our mission is sharing our joy of nature to help wildlife and people thrive. We added the people, because you all know this is a people problem you're dealing with. It's not a nature problem. It's a people problem, and we need to focus on both sides of that. So I wanted to come back to slides that I didn't create. This was given, this was given to me by Dwayne a long time ago, and his view of these restoration capacity and restoration centers. Um, and the, and the, um, the CCMP has identified four of us, um, Marine Discovery Center, the Zoo and Aquarium, um, FAU Harbor Branch, and the Florida Oceanographic as these restaurants. We've met informally. We'd like to start working together more formally. And we thought this would be a great chance to come to you and ask you to direct staff to create an MOU. They're much better at that than we are. Um, and you know, you've got four different institutions. We all play really nice. But I think if it starts with the NEP and says, here's a draft, we can come back to you and hopefully approve an MOU at your next meeting. So that is our request. Um, and in summary, these are all the different things we hope to bring, um, starting with these IRL regional centers of excellence. Together, I'm hoping next time there's a manatee problem, we might have an answer to say, hey, we can actually feed them in place in places, not have to wait for them to gather in warm water spots and just restore their food source as an example of it. Um, so that is my presentation. And um, so here is the requested action. Um, and I will be happy to answer any questions and then turn it back to you. Great. Those questions for Keith. I don't have a question. I just wanted to make mention. Uh, Keith Winston came to my office right after I got elected, and he invited me to the zoo. And I'm sure he does that with all the commissioners. Uh, but probably unlike most of the commissioners, I said, "Yeah, not really interested," because I've been to zoos in Detroit, and Philadelphia, and San Diego, and they're supposed to be "quote unquote" great zoos. To me, boring. I'm an, out, I'm an outdoors guy. I like to be on and in the community of nature. So he bugged me enough. I finally said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'm their biggest supporter now because it is an experience. It's not just, you're not going to just go there and see an animal caged laying around doing nothing. You're going to see these animals in actual habitat. So if you haven't been there, you need to go just to experience what they have to offer. And if you do that, then you'll get some clue as to what he's talking about with regard to this aquarium, because it will be an experience. It won't just be a static uh, location where you can see, oh, there's a shark or there's a <clears throat> manta ray. You're going to see these animals, these creatures in their habitat actively participating in life. So it's something to look forward to, and I'm looking forward to it. I know you've done an awful lot of work already, but if anybody hasn't been to our zoo, you should take the time to do that. Thank Great. you. Commissioner Adams. Yeah, I just want to follow up on Commissioner Smith's comment. So my first introduction to Keith and the Brevard Zoo was when they were involved with the um, Elephant Center project in Felsmere. And, you know, through that process, I have to say the zoo is very dedicated to conservation, best practices, um, and, and the research in how we protect our living environment, whether it's through the animals or the habitat. So very, very, um, just that was a great process to go through. Um, things changed with the way elephants were housed. So the, the center was not as much needed as before, but I think this is like that next step in identifying a need and really trying to get um, the zoo involved in bringing those resources to the table. So I'm super excited to see this moving forward. And I think at the end of the day, um, the MOU is a, is a great way to go. And we will end up with something that's very beneficial to the lagoon and would be a great education piece and a research piece to kind of complement what we're doing as a council. So great. Jackie. That was a great presentation. Um, I live in Sewell's Point in Martin County, and my husband and I have visited the zoo and had a great time. I can't remember the little animal in the front. They, 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 they were like in groups. Meerkats? Yes, yes, the meerkats were so cute. I bought my husband a little <laughs> button, and it's still on his shelf. We watched them for hours because they were like looking for predators. It was just, the, everything was wonderful. Um, I've heard about you for years. 
Um, it's so exciting to see what you're doing, the collaboration also with Florida Oceanographic and Harbor Branch, and what was the other one? Marine Discovery Center. Is that in Volusia, yes. right? That's the old, um, where the dolphins used to jump. No, it's its, it's not... own site. It actually, it's, it's now in a high school site. Okay. Um, they do, they actually do a beautiful, like, sh uh, shoreline grasses. They, they're experts in those and great community work. And, That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, another place to drag my husband. Yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> totally uh, support what you're doing and how nice of you to think of giving back um, to the council and uh, the community. And I've seen before um, your, your work, but I, I hope we always continue the education piece about how the nutrients, the septic tanks, the fertilizers, the things that we're doing every day that are killing this beautiful place is something we can we can shift. Thank you. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? And I, one last thing, since we're sharing uh, personal uh, experiences, the first bullet point you had up there on, on impact, and I don't think you can underestimate the the visitors, but also the impact that's going to have on future generations. Speaking for myself the keystone moment in my life and get, got me interested in the environment and nature was eight, nine, ten years old, getting dropped off at the Monterey Aquarium every summer, um, visiting grandma. Parents would just drop me off and I would just spend the day uh, wandering, playing in the tide, tide pools and the fact that the East Coast and Brevard can, you know, future generations can just feel that love of nature and experience that and it's, it's going to impact a lot so well, that is our model yeah. and, and my mentor is the director there and we talk <laughs> and uh, that is absolutely the model first of all thank you and I, I really hope our impact carries to all of you and all of your ears can I share one quick story yes, on that because it goes right back to what you said um, I've done lectures for years for a friend of mine who's a law professor environmental law and I do the last lecture and I talk about zoos and impact and try to tie everything together um, and uh, he teaches at UC Santa Barbara and uh, UCLA Law School. And so I gave a talk and I explained a lot of the research shows what you just said is people who care about nature usually spend time outside in nature as a kid and they have some adults who has encouraged that. And that's why we're all about getting people in the water, literally, because that's the most powerful thing. So you can imagine a big auditorium and I'm asking all these students, you know, and I'm saying this, how many of you, you know, spend time outside in nature and all the hands go up and how many of that? And then I said, did anyone, None of that applies in one lone hand. One young woman raises her hand. And I, I was so shocked, I said, I'm just going to repeat it. I said, what the hell are you doing here? Like, why are you here? How did you get involved if you didn't spend any time outside in nature? I'm just shocked. You're getting, she's getting her master's and she's working. She said, well, when I was 16 years old, I grew up in Oakland and I thought I needed to pad my resume. And I did a summer internship at the Oakland Zoo. And so that was one of those mic drop moments for me, is that even someone isn't with nature, when they have this sort of experience, it can change them and hopefully become one of us. So thank you very much. Sure, and thank you, Keith. And it was, a, it was a great uh, presentation before you uh, depart. And I have also visited your um, zoo several times on several occasions with my two sons. And to your compliment, they're almost graduating high school, and I can probably still voluntarily get them to go to the zoo because they love <laughs> it so much. We love that. That's yes. the phrase we look for. And so. with that, look, I, I would come back to the board to... Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a motion to yes. direct staff to create an MOU. Second Great. Staff. Wonderful. We have a, a motion by Commissioner Smith, seconded by Commissioner Adams to, um, for staff to develop an MOU and bring that back to us. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Great we presentation. Okay. And our next presentation for today is something that um, uh, I see the A team from Martin County out in the audience. And um, they, Martin County has dedicated some significant resources for a 10-year, 10 10,000 um, septic to sewer conversion program. We've talked about it at this board, and we have with us, I'll let Don introduce um, all of the presenters, but Don Donaldson is our um, Deputy County Administrator in Martin County, and welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair Huntington. I, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk a little bit about a program I'm most proud of, and had the opportunity to have a small part of it. Uh, I do have quite a number of folks here today. We have uh, uh, John Mayle and uh, Diane Hughes, who you saw here earlier, 
but uh, Sam Amerson and uh, we also have uh, Dave Duncan and of course Ann Murray will be uh, making a presentation and then with SELF, our Solar Energy Loan Fund, which some of you all are familiar with, uh, we have uh, Duane uh, Andre and uh, Christina Pike. Uh, Pike, thank you. So anyway, if we go to the first slide here, I'll just give you a, I'm just going to give you a quick, quick introduction. Um, Ah. It is always me, right? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so what we have is a, uh, a project. We have a strong, comprehensive uh, uh, program. Um, it, uh, uh, we have a $160 million uh, uh, project, if you will. Our goal is to get 10,000 tanks in, in 10 years. Um, with the, what that will result in is a potential removal of over 100,000 pounds of uh, total nitrogen and 23 pounds of uh, total phosphorus per year. So we're excited about uh, getting this underway, but like most things, uh, it, it, it is, uh, it's easy to talk about when it's finally underway, but it is a long journey to get there. And this just talks a little bit about just the, the septic to sewer and the utilities apart, which in 2015, we had a study to identify and prioritize, you know, where if we were gonna do a program, which we've been talking about really for decades, where do you start with, and of course, Proximity to the river, you know, uh, high groundwater tables, uh, pr you know, the, then the economic side, where's your utilities, how you connect up to it. All those myriad of things came up with uh, a list that we still use today as terms of, of how to prioritize and group our projects. Then in uh, 2016, we uh, created a mandatory policy, and that's when we um, uh, do these larger projects on, on connection. Um, and then in 2017, but one piece in here, it's important, in 2016, we also, uh, the county had been struggling, as many of you all uh, in, in different organizations, with a backlog of infrastructure in general, um, you know, road, sewer, and, and on the like. And then also in 2016, um, we implemented a franchise fee with our local uh, FP&L provider, and that generated about $10 million a year to catch up on a lot of our infrastructure. And a big part of that was identified for environmental um, restoration infrastructure, stormwater um, retrofits, those types of things. And septic to sewer was a, was a piece of that. And then, uh, and then in 2018, we developed our, our large vacuum sewer system program. And then Sam really, when he uh, came on board, Emerson was, came from the city of Stewart, really introduced us to us this concept of connect to protect. Um, which is, uh, so essentially, and he'll describe it a little bit more, which is for larger projects, you know, those 10 plus million dollar projects where you're going to put in a massive amount of infrastructure all at once, you're doing an MSBU to help collect fees. Uh, and then we have the smaller program where it is not, um, well, we're not doing an MSBU, we're do investing in uh, just the backbone infrastructure and allowing people to connect with grinder systems and a, and a more ad hoc nature. Um, however, they've also developed some really cool tools to get that program going quicker, and that's why SELF is helping us and those, those pieces of it. So we have a 10-year capital program now. Um, we've introduced that with the state revolving, so we've now, because we've uh, a couple of years into this, um, we've been able to provide them of how uh, we can uh, utilize the state revolving phone fund uh, funds, and, and, and many of you all know that is a loan. Uh, it just so happens that currently the loan is almost 0% or 0%, so, um, uh, but we do pay it back, but that's a great source to help um, finance, if you will, um, um, these, these projects. Um, the other piece that I didn't quite mention, that franchise fee piece where we are also doing the, the um, uh, other infrastructure roads in, in older neighborhoods. So our public works department is also going in advance of where we know we're gonna do septic to sewer to try to upgrade the stormwater, put in baffle box, reconnect the uh, um, swales, um, put in some other uh, elements in preparation for the sewer project to come in. Then the sewer project is done and then we finish it off with an overlay. So you get a complete neighborhood restoration. But some of these uh, programs where um, uh, help this connect to protect are the smaller, because when we can, um, we know that it's on the list. The Public Works is using some of their franchise fee or gas tax funds to also put in these sewer force mains uh, in advance so that uh, it ties in 
Um, so it's a really, a, a, I think that's one of the also pieces I think is notable, having those two major departments work very closely together on sequencing. And, uh, and, and I'd like to say that it goes perfectly, and of course in a presentation like this, as I um, uh, mentioned earlier to someone that it, they, you know, the presentations often are, are, are glossier than they appear. In this case, it is pretty glossy, but it does, it does take a lot of effort to get these things lined up, and I'm really proud of our public works and, um, and utilities for working together. In terms of what the locals are providing and our commissioners uh, uh, most generously, um, as I said, we take a million and a half out of the franchise fee. We collect about 10 million a year for that towards the septic to sewer. And in addition, the, the uh, Board of County Commissioners is allocating two million out of state revenue sharing, um, which is we only get four and a half million out of that uh, re state revenue sharing, um, which is part of the sales tax. Our total sales tax collection is a uh, is about $14 million. So it's pretty significant percentages of those funds that are dedicated annually. And really, that is the only way that you can get this program to where, in the end, our goal was all inclusive to get uh, people hooked up to sewer um, for less than $12,000 out of their funding. Because as you know, these projects are typically fifteen to 22000 per each. And so getting it to 12,000, and most of them are coming in uh, between 10 and 12. Uh, the Connect and Protect is a little less expensive, but then we're putting a little more money in towards that. So with that, uh, that kind of gives you kind of the broad uh, picture of where we are. And Sam, you're going to come up and uh, give us a little more of the, of the details. Thank you, Don. Good morning. You're in control. Good morning. Thank you. I appreciate your time this morning, and we're glad to be here to share this program with you. Uh, as Don mentioned, it's a 10-year program. In order to manage that effectively, we've created a five-year work plan. We do it in five-year segments. Each year it's modified as projects are completed. Uh, Don did mention we coordinate with Public Works Department. They'll go in in the neighborhood restorations, uh, replace drainage culverts and uh, great swales, etc. Uh, that infrastructure will come in with the sewer system, and then following that, Public Works will do uh, milling and resurfacing of the roadways. Uh, with the five-year program, uh, it, when it's completed, we should have uh, sewer service available to more than 7,000 properties, uh, and we're on track to do that now. And with this five-year program, we expect to reduce nitrogen loading by 72,000 pounds per year, and total phosphorus by 15,000 pounds per year. This is our five-year work plan. Uh, it's a little difficult to read, I apologize, but we break it down into the top portion is our large uh, vacuum-assisted gravity sewer. As Don mentioned, those typically run 15 to $22,000 per, per unit, per household. Uh, but with the grant funding uh, and Board of Commissioners funding and other sources, uh, we can keep that to a cap of $12,000. The commissioners thought that was a good number to reach, and as Don mentioned, we've been able to stay just below that. The bottom portion is the Connect to Protect Grinder Sewer Program. And as you can see, uh, in working with the Public Works Department, we identify when drainage will begin, when grinder sewers will begin, and then when the paving uh, will be completed. This is a poster we use for our neighborhood workshops when we're going to put uh, vacuum sewers in a neighborhood and so it's very educational uh, as a graphic and what this is if you're not familiar this is uh, technically it's a gravity sewer system that's assisted by vacuum and it's a sawtooth collection system throughout the neighborhood there's a valve pit that's located uh, in the road right of way it will serve about four homes three to four homes each depending on location of the homes uh, and the size of the properties we have a vacuum pump station, one pump station for each project, and this has large vacuum pumps. It pulls a vacuum throughout the gravity system. And when the valve pit, and uh, to your left, when the valve pit opens, it's a predetermined level, that will open, and that wastewater will be pulled out of that. It goes at a high, high speed uh, to the pump station, and then it's transmitted from there with uh, sewage pumps to our treatment facility. This is a picture of our latest uh, vacuum pump station. It's in a residential neighborhood, typically half-acre lots, a well-known community. Uh, we try to 
make them architecturally uh, aesthetic and pleasing. <laughs> and driving by uh, down the street, you, you glance at it, you really wouldn't know it's an industrial building or a vacuum pump station. It's a very quiet operation, and we've gotten a lot of compliments uh, on the design of those. The grinder sewer is quite a bit different system. This involves small diameter force mains within the road right of way. We put those in through our capital improvement plan and then also those projects uh, that Public Works funds a few of those as well. It consists of a plastic tank, approximately six feet deep, a sewage pump, uh, electrical panel on the house with an alarm system, and then we're a gravity connection from the household to the tank. And then that's a pressurized pump system and it pumps out to the small force mains in the road right of way. These are located completely on private property and our program, uh, we first initiated this. The cost was, uh, with all the fees, everything added up about a little over $11,000. We discounted that to $10,000. We further discounted it in the first year. So when these projects are completed, we'll send out notifications to every property owner in the community. And if they connect in the first 365 days, we call that the sign up and save period, we discounted additional $2,000. So their cost is $8,000. And with your funding that you provided, we give them an additional $1,000 discount. So it costs $7,000 per home. And it's been very popular. I think we've got 350 installed today in the first year and a half of the program. Right. And this is really how it works. It's a one-stop shop. Uh, we don't like uh, individuals have challenges when it comes to hiring a plumber, getting things installed, abandoning septic tanks. So. We got authorization from the board to go out to bid. We competitively bid the installation of these grinder systems. And so when a resident wants to connect, they contact our project manager, Dave Duncan. They come in, sign the agreement, installation agreement, and our contractor installs the tank, the pump, the electrical panels. They actually go into the attics at times to pull wire from the panel to this outside control panel. It's all done uh, through the county. The customer has one stop, and that's it. They, they come in and pay, and we do the rest. And it's been a very popular program. It's uh, very unintrusive, and as you can see, the restoration takes place, and uh, it, it's been going quite smoothly. And at this point, I'll let Andre, uh, Dwayne Andre, come up and talk to you about our financial arrangement. Thank you, Sam. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure. Uh, let me introduce my colleague, Christine Papke. I'm Duana Andrade, and I am the Chief Strategic and Financial Officer for the Solar and Energy Loan Fund. And I just want to give you a brief background, if I may, on what SELF is, and then talk about this great program that we've been able to launch with Martin County Utilities. And Honestly, I'm very impressed with their leadership and their creativity to get this um, off the ground. So SELF is a nonprofit CDFI, which is a community development finance institution. Uh, CDFIs are created to fill financing gaps and specialize in um, serving underserved, underprivileged communities with low-cost financing. SELF's mission really is to rebuild and empower uh, underserved communities through providing access to affordable financing for sustainable home improvements. And basically that means everything from high efficiency air conditioners, um, uh, rooftop uh, solar PV, um, solar pumps, and very importantly, climate resilience improvements, which are basically roofs that are wind resistant, impact windows, hurricane shutters, et cetera. And of course, related to our mission, which is ultimately to also not only improve the quality of life, safety, and, and um, health in homes, is to reduce carbon emissions into the environment, is water quality. We can't leave water quality and conservation out of the formula. So SELF really embraces everything that advances this holistic mission of improving people's lives, reducing operating costs in homes, and at the same time, improving the environment. So with that, uh, we've been in existence for 10 years now. We were started by St. Lucie County. Commissioner Sadovsky here was one of the original founders of SELF. We thank you for that. And uh, we've been operating for 10 years. We've raised about $25 million in capital, deployed 
$19 million in over 2,100 loans that are unsecured, 74% for low and moderate income populations with low credit scores, and we have less than 2% default rates. So we have a proprietary, uh, proprietary model by which we're able to provide small unsecured loans to people with low credit scores um, in a way that's sustainable for everybody and also advances financial inclusion. And this is the program that we brought to Martin County Utilities to be able to make their program more inclusive because we don't want to leave anybody out. And too many people get left out of the traditional financing system that's based on credit scores. So with that, <clears throat> we are very nimble, flexible. We're able to customize programs. And um, this program, the Connect to Protect uh, program, is a, an example of what we can do when we partner with local governments, um, with other nonprofit organizations. So we really crowd in private, public, and philanthropic capital. Um, we have funding from banks, CRA investments, and also from the CDFI fund, and also from local government. In the case of Martin County Utilities, we sat down one day and they asked basically if we could finance their, product, uh, their projects. And after talking about the funding that they had, et cetera, we um, started off with $200,000 that were available to finance about 20 projects. And we ultimately said, well, why do 20 projects when we can do 200? How self can leverage those $200,000 and bring in $2 million? And let's start with that. So that's what we did. Self raised $2 million allocated to this program and um, had a great working relationship. Took us about a year to put it all in place. But really this was made possible because Martin County Utility was also open to collecting through their on-bill uh, program. Uh, our, so it, it helps us with the risk when we have a partner that will collect on the uh, utility bill. So with that, we were able to provide an $85 fixed um, monthly fee uh, loan, uh, 10 years, unsecured, and um, it's, just, it's, it's just taken off in this past year, and so far it's been very successful. And I'm gonna let Christine, who actually works closely with David in those installations that you saw, talk about just uh, our numbers and also um, maybe one client experience. And with that, just tell you that we're extremely thankful and pleased. And that this model, by the way, is a national model because self operates in Florida statewide, but we also have a footprint in Alabama, South Carolina. We're opening up Georgia in the next two weeks and then Tennessee and Texas. And as part of the National uh, Green Bank Association, they are looking at our programs. And this is one that is really attracting a lot of attention. So. Kudos to you all, or just the national model now. So, Christine, how, uh, how much have we done so far? So far, we've um, done 65 loans um, for $450,000. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank David and his team for <coughs> making this a, a wonderful process for self as well as the client. Uh, it's I haven't had a single client that has been... Um, upset or it, it's just been a seamless process all the way through. Um, we work closely together and bounce things off of each other and um, Christine is the go-to person. She is our special um, loan officer. So everybody goes to Christine. She solves everybody's problems and like I said what we're trying to do here is really advance inclusivity to let people participate um, in this program. So with that just wanted to, again, um, thank everybody and let you know that we are happy to continue this program even beyond the, the, the stage where there is a subsidy or a rebate. And um, we are here to serve communities and facilitate this flexible financing as needed. So any questions? Madam Thanks. Chair. Yes. Uh, I feel like my baby just grew Did up. Did <laughs> <laughs> um, Time to take a victory lap. Did you not just um, present and testify in Congress? Uh, so again, a regional asset uh, right in our area uh, has been asked to come to Congress and, and to speak on these types of issues and the funding side. So please take a victory lap. Fantastic. Well, yes, thank you. Um, Self has uh, been asked to testify in the Senate 
and um, two weeks ago in a congressional hearing on the climate crisis because, again, we're one of the few programs and the only green bank, which is also green uh, CDFI, which means that we're really focused on LMI, low and moderate income communities. Mm -hmm. And that's important because about 40% of Americans fall into the category of low and moderate income um, working class people. So um, just proud to represent uh, the region. Thank you. Okay. I just want to follow up, and I'm going to ask Martin County. We're having a three-county um, collaborative very soon, and I would like, if, it, if it's possible, to actually share this information uh, at that meeting. Um, I think I'll, since I, I think I'm going to be the chair, well, I'll be the chair, but uh, kind of bring it forward because I've been trying to lay the groundwork for this for about eight years, uh, and you certainly bypassed me. <laughs> <laughs> going 450,000 miles an hour. So um, this is really uh, sometimes having another county share these types of experiences uh, gives my staff, my utility, uh, our administration, the, um, the wherewithal that, yes, we can think outside the box. We can move differently. And uh, uh, just for Martin County specifically, and the reason why I ask you to, to present, is we have more than 40,000 septic tanks along the 10-mile creek. Uh, all of which are, are, are effluent into the <laughs> creek and into oh, your into your front yard, backyard, uh, at the North Fork and the St. Lucie River. So that's really important. And, and, and as this process occurs, um, we as a county can work with Port St. Lucie and the city of Fort Pierce uh, being able to, to do these transformative uh, opportunities. Um, and, you know, as part of this, we're also putting $34 million to actually create new capacity uh, uh, in the, the sewer system and by removing uh, the, the wastewater plant off the island and out of the lagoon. Uh, so the bigger picture of what we're trying to accomplish is creating the utility and the capacity to do that, but most importantly, create those opportunities to take the septic tanks offline and onto sewer. So it's, if, if it's possible um, to, to present, and I can ask uh, my administration to make time. I, I, absolutely, Commissioner. I think um, uh, we, we're, we're very happy to share it. I think uh, the idea of uh, working with SELF on providing these loans, um, you said it took us a year, I think, with a, our legal to figure out what happens if somebody defaults and all those different things. It's unsecured. Hey, you're putting it on your utility bill. Uh, all those little <laughs> tiny details which you think at a high level, why is it taking so long? We've gone through all of that. Now it's actually uh, uh, being implemented in the field, and I think uh, we—I think it's a great program that we'd love to share with uh, with anybody. The good selling point is uh, subject tanks now are going into the twenty thousand dollar range. So on that side of the equation, it's a much more uh, effective and, and cost effective uh, opportunity. Um, and then I've. Uh, Previous um, appraisers that I've spoken to have indicated that uh, water and sewer uh, actually increases the value of the property anywhere from ten to twenty-five thousand uh, dollars when installed. So, uh, especially if you're taking it from a septic to sewer uh, opportunity, so Absolutely. it's just value, value, value. So mm -hmm. that's the story we try to tell in, in getting people to participate. <clears throat> And I think following up on that value, Don did a good job of mentioning but, but the extreme coordination and collaboration between public works and utilities, I think, is one of the one of the things that makes this program what it is. I mean, and the residents, of course, are extremely happy that they're getting this this full neighborhood restoration project and public works is not coming in following, you know, a septic to sewer project or vice versa. Yeah. And if I could just add one thing, I think the one thing that Sam glossed over, which is which was uh, something that for 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 me was difficult, one of those issues uh, where we took the responsibility to actually construct the tank. And you know, so oftentimes it's like the lines up to here, go call your plumber or contractor mm -hmm. to abandon your tank. So we took that risk of actually saying, you know what, we just get a, a letter of agreement with the property owner to enter their property and take on that whole management of the project. So between that and self, it's really a one-stop shop. They come in, and for some of these folks, I, you know, we've got the force main out there now. They just sign up, and it's going to be $85 a month on their bill, and they don't do anything. That's it. You know, I kind of, my vision was when talking to Sam was if my, my mother, who's 92, needed this and I wasn't in town, how would they get something like this accomplished? And really, they've done it. That's another kind of a unique piece that he doesn't talk about that really, um, really makes it easy on the customer. Great. Anne's going to come up and talk to you a little bit more. I'm going to take you home. Yes. Okay. 
So just to get on the uh, on this goodwill train, I think that um, this program is one of the most exciting that I've worked um, on in Martin County in my career, my career here at the county. Um, so much so, this pro this program is so powerful that we've had a lot of interest in other um, from other entities who want to replicate our program and even share our branding. So I think that that's a really good sign that there's this heightened awareness and that there's a path forward that is um, at this being forged. So this is, um, I'm just one of scores of people who are working on the Connect to Protect program. I wanted to give you a quick overview. Let's see if I can get this. Is this something to do with an arrow? Arrow right. Arrow right. Put the My, okay, let's see. I think I skipped ahead. So only four slides. So I wanted to give you a quick overview of the, uh, the grant, the, um, where the recipient, the very fortunate recipient of the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program grant. Um, I, the first two um, points on the slide indicate that there's a, this is a one-year grant, a fiscal year grant, and that uh, there are, it's valued at $150,000. Um, we have 150 units, uh, Sam was explaining, that we offer an incentive of $1,000 to reduce that cost of connection from $8,000 and reduce it to $7,000 with your help. And this is very significant. I, my observation is that homeowners want to do the right thing. They want to see uh, an increase in the quality of water. They understand what that means environmentally. Five years ago, that was really not the case. I think that we had a harder sell. We were doing um, big studies to to convince people that it wasn't just the lake, it was septic tanks. And they'd be like, what, my backyard? Now, five years later, this is such a much more accepted program. And because of that, it's being embraced. So it will not come uh, as a surprise to you that our 2020, 2021 grant, we have closed out in July three months early, and that is really exciting. So I've had the good fortune to work with Dan and Dwayne and Kathy um, in coordinating this grant. So we are, we're gonna be closing this one out and we're looking forward to the next um, grant with the uh, agreements been executed and we are looking forward to starting that in October. And we are hoping to also um, close that one out early because people know about these things. They know about self, they know about our good partnerships. So, Quite exciting. So where have we worked? Um, where has where have those 150 connections gone? And you can see from the map to the right that these are very uh, close proximity to the waterways, of course. So for the presentations that we've seen today, how important it is to increase the quality of this water and that we're taking these septic tanks offline and connecting them to central sewer is so significant. It is one of the most significant things we can do with um, reducing those nutrient loads. So that, that's where we've worked in this last year. Sam showed you a five-year map earlier, and that would incorporate um, the properties that we'll be looking at, the, the, um, the basins, the sub-basins that we'll be looking at for next year's grant. I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, nutrient reduction program. We actually, um, this, this program is pretty sophisticated now, and so are the, the way that we look at um, the credits for um, total nitrogen and, and total phosphorus. So whereas we were estimating, based on various methodologies in the past, collectively as a state, uh, DEP has worked with the um, Florida State University, Dr. Yi, to develop something called the ARC Inlet uh, model. And this takes into account uh, the the volume of the, the septic tank, the proximity to waterways, the soil type, and it <clears throat> makes a more uniform way of measuring um, nutrient load, thus nutrient load reduction when you take a septic tank offline. So we are working with our consultants. This is um, to the right, you'll see a flow diagram um, that indicates in the Golden Gate area, this is one of our vacuum, um, uh, vacuum sewer areas, it indicates in those yellow and red vectors where septic, a good working, let's it's a, it's a conceptual good working septic tank and what that looks like when, um, when it, it hits the ground uh, water and then finds its, finds its way to the waterways. 
So you can see that the closer to the waterways, the more significant the vectors, that how outstanding they are. So that is a, that really supports all of what we were talking about today in nutrient reduction. Um, from the modeling that we're doing, uh, we are going to take that ARCIT nut modeling from the Golden Gate and we're going to expand it to all the sub-basins in our five-year plan and then our 10-year plan. And from that, we're also going to explore, the, now the ARC inlet is just um, total nitrogen. Um, we're going to extrapolate total phosphorus. We don't believe it all gets caught up in, t in, in, a, in the soil column. We think some of that is getting released into the water and it's not being accounted for. So we're taking an extra step to make sure that we capture all of the nutrient value so that we have a better understanding. And we'll be working directly um, with DEP in, in moving this program forward because it's a little uncertain as to the guidance of how to apply the of ARC inlet modeling. So we're excited to be on the cutting edge of this. We're also doing another step, which is uh, we're working to, in a two-year program, possibly three in the Golden Gate area, to actually truth the model. So we want to see how do we, how do we validate the model that we create. So what we're doing is surface and groundwater sampling in order to understand the before, during, and after connection reductions so that we really understand how, um, how they work together both from a, a, um, a ground standpoint and from the modeling standpoint. So really thrilled to be a part of that program. We've been talking about partnerships, and I think this slide just kind of sums that up. We, we have worked through the process, but it takes a lot, a lot of people and a lot of partners. And we're just very, very pleased to have this partnership with, with the council and greatly appreciate your support in supporting this really significant program. So with that, I will um, open it up to any general questions. But any questions for Ann? Go ahead, Jackie. This is so interesting. Thank you so much. Can you please go back to the map of um, Golden Gate? I'm so glad you find this interesting. Because sometimes I talk and I think I'm the only one who really finds this interesting. It's like, do you see the vectors? We are. Totally. Totally. So if you don't mind, I, I was just, it's not that important, but is that, is that Indian Street on the far left? Yes, it is. Okay, so, so is it because Indian of the topography US. that it gets brighter with more yellow? So what we've, the inferences can be made to date because this is our first model and it's actually, we have, um, oops. Hmm. Good. There we go. Um, the inference is that the closer you are to the water body, the more significant the nutrient load is. This makes sense, right? The right. further away you are, the, the more time it has to travel to enter the waterway. So that's really what's significant here. Did I answer questions? That yes, we and so, um, I mean, I know almost everything's been channelized and changed, but the, the water bodies in the middle of Golden Gate, which are, don't appear, perhaps they are attached, but they're so kind of cut off. Yes, they, you're they too right. um, have the same effect. It doesn't. It doesn't matter if you're. It's a moving. You know, like a river moving. It's uh, or a creek moving. It could also be a, la a lake or any body of water. Absolutely, and all these water. All these what look like isolated uh, water bodies are actually are connected to the system. We have sampling stations set up on each of those interior, and then. Um, but the uh, properties that are uh, closer into the, um, into the main channel. So in other words, yes, you're absolutely right. Those are significant, they do contribute, and that's why, that's why they're showing up with heavy vectors. Very interesting, and I can say that I grew, I grew up in North Souls Point. Um, my mother and father still live in North Souls Point on uh, Banyan Road, and they're one of the 41 people that had their systems uh, changed out. And for whatever reason, my mother has two, had two septic tanks, which yes. was very strange. All a the kids of, were trying too. to get that, it, who knows. Um, but uh, it, I was there um, a lot, I, I visit them quite a bit uh, as all this was going on. And I am telling you, I could not believe how much time the people who were working on this took to find the right place. 
it was, I was just so impressed that, I mean, so thoughtfully done, you know, patient with my mother, um, good, good work. It's great. Thank you. And thank you for doing Sewell's Point. Now we have to do South Sewell's Point. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. Gets right. All right. Anybody, Anybody else? else? Okay. Well, thank you. I think it, I'm a little biased, but that was a fabulous presentation. And um, I hope, you know, some of the council members can take some of that information and, and Don um, will bring that to the collaborative meeting. Great. Thanks for so, the opportunity. And we hope to be back here next year. Wonderful. Some more good news. Thank you so much. Now we are moving on to old business. Uh, we have an update on the Geo Collaborate DOP grant process, and Dan, you're going to do that update? Sure. So I just want to give you an update on the Geo Collaborate uh, project that we have with FDEP. Uh, since our last meeting back in May, uh, we've produced all or purchased all the Geo Collaborate instances. Uh, we have executed all our subcontracts, uh, acquired all the licenses and software uh, that we need to set up this project. Uh, we have had our administrative GIS coordinator set up the, start working with the data. So she worked with uh, Chuck at St. John's to get their data as well as uh, the data from South Florida and we're still working with FAE to get their data incorporated. Uh, so they're working on getting all the water quality parameters set up and she's taking it and uh, using the Kriging method to kind of make these really nice looking um, maps for us for when we actually do the sessions. Uh, what I want to point out on this map, which is kind of interesting, is on the uh, right there you see a, a map with a lot of different dots and that's from uh, FEU Harbor Ranch's uh, contract with us for the monitoring plan. So that's kind of a list of all the stations that we could potentially put into this uh, project and the, the small little maps you see on the left are just uh, select water quality uh, parameters so that's really just one of those dots that you see all the way on the right so there's a lot of data that could go into this and we hope at some point possibly um, but that's just to kind of give you an idea so next steps uh, we will be closing out task one in October we're well into task two and in November you will actually get to see how this plays out in one of what they call the instance sessions. So look forward to that in November. I'll take any questions if you have any okay. at this point. Any, any questions? Okay, thank you. That was an informational item only, so okay. Um, our next matter of old business is the 2023 RFP categories and financial allocations for the 2023 budget. All right, so it's that time in, uh, of our year where we issue our RFPs between usually in October and November. Uh, so I want to go over the, our categories and our financial allocations for those. And um, this is actually going to lead into one of our next agenda items. Um, we're going to have the same uh, categories that we'd like to for our next upcoming year with a, a couple different changes. So in our past year, uh, we had water quality, but we issued it at 500,000. Uh, this year, we'd like to increase it to 600,000. Uh, and that is due to some additional funding that you'll see in the budget amendment in our next agenda item uh, from our financial statements. So we're going to like to take some of that uh, balance money and put it into water quality. We're going to keep uh, habitat restoration at the same amount at 200,000. Also have community-based restoration the same as last year at 200,000. Uh, our science and innovation RFP that comes out of EPA funding at 100,000, keep that the same. Um, small grants would stay the same at 25,000. And this year, uh, our CAC had been, uh, during several prior meetings, really kind of bringing up this community education and outreach ask. And so with that additional funding left over from our financial statements of 2020, we'd like to uh, reissue a new RFP for $50,000 in that aspect. Are there any questions? Any questions? Aaron, is there a question? No. Okay. No. So with that, we'll need a motion um, to approve those financial allocations. Madam Chair, I'd be happy to make a motion to approve the financial allocations for fiscal year 2023 RFPs. Second. 
Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Commissioner Sadowski. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries with. And for clarification, that was also included to go ahead and issue. To authorize and issue. To authorize yes. and issue them in November of this year. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, Car it carries, but I see that Commissioner. Um, Robbins is absent, so. Okay. Right, so we're moving on to new business now. We have the fiscal year 2021 final budget amendment and still with you, Dan. <laughs> All right, so uh, as we were talking about the RFP allocations for 2023, that's kind of uh, comes back to this uh, resolution for our amendment in 2021 by resolution 2004. So with our uh, financial statements of 2020 being completed, uh, we are reconciling that fund balance with active projects that are carrying over from prior fiscal years, uh, bringing that into this budget. And by doing, if all those expenses, all those projects ended, all our current fiscal year budget expenses were fully expended, we would have a balance of 550,000 888 left and uh, in that part of it is restricted license plate so 308,000 of it is uh, that would leave us roughly about two hundred and forty thousand dollars of unrestricted and that's what we are going to pass through uh, into 2023 for those RFPs that we talked about earlier any questions for Dan okay that back to the board and I'm looking at Looking sure. for a motion. Madam Chair, I'd be happy to make a motion. <clears throat> Excuse me. To adopt the amendments to the fiscal year 2021 budget by resolution 2021-04 pursuant to Florida statutes. Second. Okay, good. We have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Adams, seconded by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Sorry, with Commissioner uh, Robbins absent. Okay, now we have the 2022 budget amendment. So our 2022 uh, budget amendment is to bring that 550,000 from the end of fiscal year 2021 into it. Uh, it puts it pretty much into reserve until we need it for 2023. Uh, with one slight change uh, in J July of this year, FRS increased their rates for contributions. So we were asking just a small $9,000 increase the salary and benefits to cover that cost for, for FRS. And that's it. Okay, great. Okay, Council, look for a motion to adopt. Madam uh, Chair, I'll be happy to make a motion to adopt the amendments to the fiscal year 2022 final budget by resolution 2021-05 pursuant to Florida statutes. Okay, thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Zadelsky. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion carries unanimously with Commissioner Robbins absent. Okay, and we have the independent auditor service contract. Uh, right. So at the last meeting, y'all instructed us to issue an RFP for our audit services. Uh, that was issued and we received two responses. One was from our prior uh, Auditor James Moore and Company, and we also received a new uh, proposal from Car Riggs and Ingram. Uh, it was sent out to the Auditor Selection Committee, which was a group of three members. Uh, one was from the Governing Board here, and two members from the Management Conference. Uh, they ranked and scored that based on the criteria in the RFP. Uh, it was very, very close. Uh, it was only one point separated the two auditors. Uh, however, it was noted that the score for Cars Riggs and Ingram was higher than. Uh, James Warren Company. So based on the statute, it says that you should if, um, take the highest rank. There is the option to go to a, the other um, firm if there is a reason, a valid reason to. Madam Chair, I just from a standpoint of, of knowing what we do, it's, it's a little different than some other agencies and the, the moving parts. I think historic knowledge uh, in, uh, is is important. Uh, I don't have a dog in the fight. I just simply, you know, just from that standpoint, 
understanding what we do, how we do it, and the number of moving parts and the agencies that are involved. It's a much bigger picture, and having had that experience for a longer period of time, um, I think is a, is a value. But uh, I just want to open up to the board for my thought process. Okay. So I was um, the governing board member that was on the audit committee. And I can, I can tell you, at least from my perspective, I can't speak for the other members of that committee. Um, they were the two applicants or that came through were, were very similar in certain things, but the applicant that actually um, won, I suppose at this point, did have a lot of experience with other boards that were more similar to us. Um, that kind of dealt with some of the same funding mechanisms. Um, so I don't know if that's why they, they came out higher, um, but you know, I, I, I don't want to say it's six to one, half a dozen or the other, but they were, they were very close in some of their experiences. Um, and you know, for me, I, I think sometimes it's a good thing to kind of switch up auditors because uh, you get into a rut with the same ones. But um, I just throw that out there for what it's worth. But the but the one that we would be looking at at this point did have a lot of experience with similar boards. That, that's my biggest thought process, that because we're so unique in the number of assets that, that we bring to the table and the funding sources, uh, having some knowledge of that I think is a very important. So. Okay. So then we would need some direction to authorize the staff to negotiate um, into a contract for the firm. Some of the, um, the highest rank firm. Um, so we have a motion by Commissioner Smith, okay. seconded by Commissioner Adams. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion Aye. carries um, unanimously with Commissioner Robbins absent. Okay, so we have our EPA grant closeout. All right, so this is just for information for y'all, and I will um, kind of touch on this a little bit more in my project update. Uh, but EPA grant CE00D36215, which was uh, from 2015 or fiscal year 2016 through fiscal year 2019, but was extended due to COVID to the end of this current year, uh, has been completed. Uh, I've issued the form SF-425 to the Federal Financial Forum to Research Triangle Park and the final technical report to US EPA Region 4. Uh, we spent it down to the last penny. So all that amount, 2502050 was spent. Excellent. Any questions on the EPA grant? No questions, no action required on that one. And um, thank you, Dan. And we're moving along pretty efficiently. And uh, we have our NEP staff reports with our first report, communication report by Kathy Hill. Thanks. So I wanted to update you on just a few things, uh, mostly social media, but we have tried a new tack this time. We are doing some paid advertisement. And we started with, the, with one, and I'm gonna show you two of these because they're just short, they're 15 seconds long. But we started with one ad. Um, and tried it out in Brevard and Indian River County. It cost us about $1,500 to play it for 30 days on YouTube. And YouTube is a younger audience for us. Um, mostly younger people use YouTube. Um, so we wanted to see if it was a viable thing to do and if it was cost effective to do. So we started with this one ad. Uh, at the end of the 30 days, 106,000 people had looked at it which we thought was great. And then half of those folks stayed for the whole thing. So they didn't click the little skip ad thing that you can do. Um, so we thought that was great. Um, when you do the math on that, it's about 1.4 cents per view. And you can see the demographics there that it's a much younger crowd was the bulk of that audience. So, and let me just play those for you. So this is the car wash ad. Okay, so that used to be me, washing my car in the driveway with uh, help <laughs> from the kids. But now I prevent harmful runoff into the IRL by washing my car in the lawn. It just took one small change for us to live lagoon friendly. 
Uh, and then uh, I'll just give another random one. Um, this one is a proper fertilization, so obeying the summer fertilizer bans and then using phosphate free for the rest of the year. I've lived in the IRL my whole life and always follow summer fertilizer bans. But I've learned using phosphate free fertilizers the rest of the year keeps my yard lagoon friendly all the time. Turns out you're never too old to learn something new. Yep, so that is that. <laughs> Oh, and if I can go back to that for a sec. No, no, I can't. In the IRL region, oh, fishing has... Sorry, bear with me a sec. So on our YouTube channel, uh, it's Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program on YouTube. Uh, we have a whole playlist of all of our videos now, except for the 10 Rs. Those aren't up there yet, but they will be. Uh, but this whole top row is our um, advertisements, and I'll just show you what those look like going back to our PowerPoint. So we have a whole suite of these now. So we have fertilizer one, we have a keeping lawn waste on your yard one. There is one for native plant gardening, one for picking up your pet waste, two for safe boating now. So there's one that I just approved the other day that is out now um, for safe boating and for checking your engine before you go out just to take you know 30 seconds to look to make sure you're not leaking anything into the lagoon. And we have a litter one. Um, so we're taking ideas for next year. We think this is very viable. Uh, and very cost effective. So we're gonna continue with these next year. Um, so if you have thoughts on what good ads would be uh, to live lagoon friendly, we're happy to take those thoughts. Uh, Facebook continues to grow. So that audience is growing now by about 30 people a month. Uh, we were doing, just for comparison, several months ago before we started issuing the videos, it was about five people a month. Now with the videos, we're doing about 30 a month. So that audience is growing. We're really happy about that. Instagram continues to be a work in progress. Um, we are using mostly our calendar photos for that, so it's sort of an inspirational quote and a pretty picture. Um, the audience is growing. It's you know things are moving in the right direction, but one up, one month it's up, one month it's down. It's very hard to see any trends with Instagram, so we're gonna we're gonna tweak that a little bit uh, as we move forward. And then Twitter continues to be another work in progress. Um, we're not getting a lot of growth in this audience yet, so we have some ideas about how we can start growing that a little more, um, and we're hoping to do that. But Facebook right now is our bread and butter, which we're happy about because that's what most people are familiar with, um, so that we think that's moving well in the right direction. And then lastly, I wanted to share this with you. Um, some of you have seen this already, so you know that we have uh, gained control of the administration of the license plate. And we think it's time for a refresh for our friendly neighborhood snook. Um, so we're gonna refresh him. We have asked our ideas folks to give us some ideas on that. And our first thought was, because we have this great logo, we wanted to do maybe something with the logo and put that on the license plate. And so they gave us some ideas for that. And we liked that. We weren't wowed by it, but we liked it. Um, and then they gave us something that we really do like, and I'll show you that now. And so this is our new thought for what the license plate could look like. Um, the snook started out very, very much a cartoon and then uh, evolved into something more realistic and oil painting-like. So um, we're real happy with where this sits right now. And if you all approve today, we'd like you to just tell us to keep moving forward and what our next steps would be for this is to pull the whole management conference, in, including you all, with, um, with a few designs. So it would be one based on the logos, one based on the art, and then uh, we want to do a social media push for this. So we'll also do polls on social media seeing what people would buy and we're hoping to generate a little support for sales by doing that. Uh, so we'll bring that back to you in November for final approval, and we'll hopefully have a final version of the plate by then as well. Is that the Jupiter Lighthouse in the background? It could be any lighthouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So we have two red lighthouses in the lagoon. There's one in the south and one in the north, and depending on where you live, that's the one it is. <laughs> Good answer. So that's all, that's all for me. Great. Thank you, Kathy. We're going to um, have our project update by Dan. Right. 
So at the end of quarter three, uh, we had 42 projects or activities still in progress. Uh, two projects finished during quarter three, and we have a couple that finished between quarter three and today, so they'll be coming up to you in the November meeting. Uh, the two that finished was a, a small grant called Live It Like a Local, uh, Be Lagoon Friendly, and this was done by uh, Florida Indian River Lagoon Coalition. And do you have the pamphlets, or did they already get them? Yeah. yeah, so we already gave you up there the pamphlets that were produced uh, by that small grant. And... Um, the other project was the RLNEP uh, CCMP management plan communication with stakeholders. Um, I'm going to go into both projects in just a second. Looking into fiscal year 2022, we have 10 projects starting and five uh, multi-year contracts renewing. So a little bit more about that Love It Like a Local uh, small grant. This was uh, developed uh, with help from design by Brant Rone, who is actually one of our, the council's uh, publication editor uh, service contracts that we uh, did back in May. Um, they distributed that to 26 different locations, mostly email, uh, some print, and 4,500 of those were actually printed. Here's kind of what you have in your hands, some <clears throat> idea of what it looks like. Most of these photos were used from our calendar contest, and it kind of touches on how to do some lagoon-friendly uh, things, uh, such as, you know, how to stuff with your yard, uh, your pets, voters, new homeowners. So the key they, they targeted was uh, HOAs and realtors, uh, realtor associations. Yeah, so new homeowners coming in that kind of didn't know anything about it, they would target those people on how to you know, take care of themselves and, and be lagoon friendly. And that was done with under $5,000 small grant from the council. Uh, the second project uh, was one that we worked on, and this was the last one to close out that EPA grant. So this was an EPA-funded project. Uh, it included uh, annual reports that we had over several years, uh, those 30-second videos that you've all started to see now based on the CCMP vital signs. Uh, it paid for uh, editing the strategies of the financing, the CCMP concurrence document that you've been hearing about from Duane. Um, it also funded some purchase of materials for events once a lot of more in-person events start happening. Also did editing of the CCMP back in 2019 and the survey back in 2018, 2017 that we did for that CCMP. That's all again. Questions on the project update? Great, no, thanks. I think that, that we have come leaps and bounds and doing a phenomenal job communicating some of these things. And we're going to have our executive director report today given uh, on behalf of Dwayne by Kathy Hill. So we, we don't really have too much for you. Um, just want to remind everybody that the infrastructure bill did pass the Senate and it's going to go to the House uh, for reconciliation. But as things stand right now, there's 132 million in that bill for NEPs. And if things come through as intended and nothing changes, um, we should be getting about a million dollars a year for the next five years, starting in 2023, right? 2023. Um, so it would be a five-year bump up in our appropriation with an extra million dollars. So, and, and those will come with strings for water quality infrastructure programs, but that's our wheelhouse. That's what we do. So we're, we're super thrilled about that. Uh, and then Dwayne being Dwayne, he wanted to leave you with a deep thought, some kind of vision. Um, so this is his uh, hedgehog uh, concept. It's not his hedgehog concept, but it's the hedgehog concept. I didn't know what this was. I had to look it up. So bear with me. If you, don't, if you already know what it is, I'm sorry, but I had to look it up to explain it. Um, and it goes back to the parable of the fox and the hedgehog. And the fox has many, 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 many strategies for trying to get the hedgehog and eat it. And the, uh, the hedgehog only does one thing, but it does it with excellence. And it's able to just protect itself. And so there's a whole philosophy in business now built around this hedgehog concept. And what you see on the slide is what that is. So going from good to great is with focus on a single thing. Doing that thing with excellence. And uh, so he just wanted to share that with you. And he wants to share his thanks for all of your support and uh, just let you know that he's doing well and uh, he'll be home in a few weeks. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Any All right, questions thanks. or comments? Okay, thank you, Kathy. And we have already approached our council members report and we will start um, 
Down with you, Commissioner Zadelsky. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. I, I talked about the Taylor Creek dredging uh, that has uh, begun. We south the bid, and they're starting to build the uh, the piping now. Um, <clears throat> so that'll be ongoing uh, for the next uh, few weeks. Um, I wanted to point out uh, that uh, you know St. Louis County has been fighting for the C23-4 and 25 for probably 20 years plus. And uh, I recently got an email that I actually took offense to, but, um, but it's okay. Uh, we have been supporting the C44 and the Southern Flowway uh, for as long as I've been here and, and, and prior. So uh, my hope is that, that, that the support that we've provided uh, will come back the other direction now. Uh, the Army Corps has uh, put up $130 million to begin that process. The land has been purchased. And uh, we appreciate the cooperation from, from our partners, the South Florida Water Management District, uh, FDP, everybody, actually, because this is going to be a big project. And, and we really need to, to stop those discharges coming from the 323 uh, into, the, uh, into the North Fork. Uh, it's incredibly important. Uh, we're moving forward, as I said, uh, with the utility uh, capacity to begin to move septic to sewer, uh, also to remove the uh, wastewater plant from uh, South Beach in Fort Pierce, right at the inlet. Uh, that'll be a huge, huge opportunity. Uh, so we're continuing to negotiate with Fort Pierce Utility Authority uh, and the possibility of partnership, uh, whether we have capacity at the north section of the county or the southern, uh, or at least the, uh, the uh, uh, Midway Road uh, section of the county, because uh, Port St. Lucie has theirs just to the south there. Uh, so having to be able to have the co uh, the uh, capacity is incredibly important for us uh, to to begin to take those septic to sewer and, and to never, ever approve another development with septic tanks. Uh, it's a pet peeve of mine. And I appreciate Martin County's uh, uh, approach to policy, putting the policy in place in advance uh, so that their impetus is there to actually uh, not do septic, but to convert also. Uh, you got to have the policy, you got to have the, 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 the stick, so to speak, uh, but providing that uh, carrot provides that much more of an impetus, plus the value uh, increase is, is important. Um, as I said, uh, we're looking to move the, uh, the utility process forward. Um, that's incredibly important. We're moving to uh, we just had a budget meeting. Uh, we have some of the, I uh, get the, the fund pots of money, uh, the American Rescue Plan, I guess, uh, we were able to receive $63 million, and we're very grateful for that. But we're moving forward with a number of uh, clean water projects. All of our um, swale programs are being uh, uh, upgraded. Uh, we're looking to do the 10 Mile Creek uh, maintenance uh, process. We'll be asking South Florida for some help on that as well. Uh, the Gordy Road um, bridge is going in place, so uh, we have to clean the water up so that those who come by Gordy Road in that, that area of the, uh, 10 Mile Creek uh, will see the value in the, in the clean water side. We are also doing a couple of, uh, we're moving forward with some Oxbow programs, um, uh, reconnection of Oxbows. We just completed the Becker Road one. It's off of Selvitz, uh, not Becker Road, Becker Preserve off of Selvitz. Uh, and it's showing incredible, incredible uh, improvement from the water quality, but also um, the amount of snook that are coming up the oh, river is awesome. incredible. Uh, we actually think we're having a spawning site there, and some other uh, items have been found. Grant Gilmore uh, recently, and I can't remember the name of the fish. It's a, it's a freshwater uh, fish, but it's always been deemed as though it's a marine animal. I can't remember the name. It's it, it's part of the it's it's a member of the seahorse family, and uh, yeah, and it's endangered. And there's only a few places in Florida that it's actually uh, proliferating, uh, or it even uh, spawns. So a lot of that's happening. Uh, we're very excited that uh, we talked about Paradise Park as as an item that uh, is finally finished with its uh, roadway uh, swell system, drainage system. We're moving into Harmony Heights. Harmony Heights is actually going to be fast forwarded. Uh, we are through with phase one, moving into phase two through five. Those funds have been uh, created. Uh, we're able to now, uh, some of the folks are actually selling their properties to us to be able to create the pond sites. Uh, so that's moving much, much faster. Mm -hmm. And we're able to move forward the Sunland Gardens uh, program to do engineering and design 
uh, and that's going to be uh, hopefully within the next five years. And the reason why those those uh, communities are important is we have the C25 to the north, and we have the header canal to the south uh, of of these properties. So right in between, and all of them are on septic. So so while we have we are creating the drainage projects, we still need to get back in there and do the septic to sewer. But the effluent is not moving as fast to the canals uh, because we've created the drainage system. So. All of that's good news. Great. 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 Jackie? That's great news, Chris. Kathy, could you put up that visual? I, I wanted to start uh, by sharing a, a visual just because I found this so interesting recently. So this is um, from a book written by the Army Corps of Engineers called um, River of Interest, which is a great book if you've um, never read it. It's huge and uh, just a huge book. And um, this is a, a map from 1955 and this was the outline of the Central and South Florida Flood Control District which preceded the South Florida Water Management District and the St. John's R River Water Management District, et cetera. So it's interesting when you look at it, you can see how much we were all included in this at that time. So um, it goes up almost all the way to Volusia and um, of course goes all the way down to Monroe. And in, uh, um, I'm sure that Others up here know better than me, but in 1977, when the water management districts were formed, uh, this was split apart. And so the moral of the story is that we were originally together. And when you're looking at the Central and South Florida plan, some of the, all of the canal systems that were built after 1947, the great hurricanes and flooding that happened, the inspiration for the Central and South Florida plan, all of the canals, um, you know, we were together prior to that. I grilled um, John Mitnick, who's the head of operations for the South Florida Water Management District, and he gave me this whole history of all of the canals that are part of the Central and South Florida District. Um, north of, basically we think of, I think of C25 as kind of the end. You know what I mean? Like C25 at the border of St. Lucie and, and uh, Indian River County is kind of the end of the Central and South Florida area, but that is incorrect. All those canals went all the way up in that shaded area. And I have a map of those too, if you're interested. I just, I just found it fascinating. So um, there's some really good things uh, happening. Um, the C44 Reservoir in STTA, which is part of Indian River Lagoon South, which has been going on for a billion years, they, the Army Corps will start filling up that reservoir this October. So the STAs were completed this year by the district, but they, the Army Corps will start filling up the, the giant reservoir in October, and that will be cleaning water from the C44 canal going into the St. Lucie River. One of the things that's underway uh, is uh, a, a connecting canal, which would go north from that. They call it the interconnect, and it will be its years away, but the plan is to also clean water from C23, C24, and C25. So that's very fascinating to me. The other incredible thing, like Chris was saying up here, I mean, I've only been on the board for two and a half years. The reason I got on the board was because I was part of that movement for the um, EAA reservoir, which was amazingly secured with the help of all of the advocacy that came out of this area and Senator Joe Negron, who uh, pushed that through during that time. With that secured, basically, and it's, it was a very volatile situation and there's still a lot of time and things left to do. It's supposed to be done in 2028. But with that secured, I think I can say that, it is time to shift and start focusing on the C23, the C24, the C25, 
the money that is going forward into St. Lucie County, this is huge. We cannot miss this. We cannot miss this. And if the stakeholder support is not there, it will fade away. It's happened to other projects, and it could happen to that too. We, ha we have to work to get that going again. Um, next what, Thursday, uh, the, the district is um, doing a ribbon cutting for Bluefield. It's really a, a water farm. Bluefield Water Farm, they like, you know, they, they hold the water, they clean the water, now they call it dispersed water management, but that's exciting, and that's in the area of the old um, Halipatioke uh, Swamp and all of that, which is uh, kind of, you know, between Palm City and, and Indian Town. Um, let's see. You know, big things have happened recently, but I can't take credit for them. Uh, the, the ribbon cutting for the Kissimmee River, 30 years of work happened just a couple of weeks ago. You know, thank you to all of the people who are now gone to heaven, like Timer Powers or uh, Mariana and uh, Johnny uh, James Jones, I'm sorry, Jones, I mean, and there were other people, you know, people who gave their lives to get that river restored after the Army Corps was halfway through it and said, oh, this wasn't a good idea. You know, they did it. And it is so exciting to see the South Florida Water Management staff, who has been there for 30 years, unlike me, um, just feeling such a sense of accomplishment that it actually happened. You might remember that, I think it was last year, Irma came through and blew the whole thing out. And so they had to kind of, not the whole thing, but it blew part of that out and they had to start again. And, but now it's finished and that will start cleansing a lot of the water that goes into Lake Okeechobee. And also um, a, another thing that has been 10 or 15 years in the making, but it happened, uh, the old Tamiami Trail removal uh, down in uh, just at the beginning of Everglades National Park. That is the original Tamiami Trail that was built in 1920 and acted as a dam. Six miles of it has been taken up and it's unbelievable. As soon as it's up, you can see the water moving south into Everglades National Park. So these are exciting times. And I know that sometimes it seems like, um, oh, and I have to say that the next thing that's coming is um, C25 Groveland. Groveland will be coming. And that Groveland will be the connection between the C25 and, um, you know, what, again, like that map that used to be the connection that we changed of um, the St. John's River and the Upper Indian River, some call it the North Fork. Um, why I'm talking so much besides that I am so excited about all this stuff is just that I know sometimes it's hard because it seems like the Everglades get all the attention <laughs> and it seems like they get all the money and it seems like all the people screaming and fighting and showing off are sometimes talking about that. And I want you to know that we know that we are all connected and that that old Central and South Florida plan map is really who we are. And I will be doing everything I can with now the EAA Reservoir Secured to be making sure that we are reconnecting on every level and monetarily um, up here in, uh, where, what would you call us? We should have our own name. You know, it's, it's kind of like, it's, the, it's, it's not just the lower Indian River Lagoon, but the upper Indian River Lagoon. And absolutely, Volusia County is part of that too. So, I'm thank not, you. I'm not going away until we're done. So. That's right. <laughs> There's an incentive. <laughs> That's right, and I'll be, and I think this, um, August 25th, there is a meeting about the C23 and I mean the C24 and I'm sorry, I get them mixed up, the C23 and the C24. And um, I, I look forward to trying to re, reinvigorate people for advocacy up here because we did it. We did it down south with the EAA reservoir and we can do it up here too.
Aaron. Cool. That was inspiring. Hard to, hard to follow, I'm sitting, isn't I'm it? sitting here next to you, Jackie, feeling <laughs> the energy and passion, and I'm ready to run through a wall. I'm pumped. So, uh, that's, uh, uh, that was uh, fantastic. It, you literally got me goosebumps. So thank you. Um, we're busy, busy, busy uh, at the department. That's a great uh, thing to be and, and a good spot to be. A lot of legislation and implementation uh, ongoing with Senate Bill 712, Senate Bill 64. Our uh, friends up in the Division of Water Resources is doing a great job uh, folding all of that legislation into our operations and our work and, and rulemaking. Uh, and uh, we're also continuing to grow into our uh, assumption of 404. So that's progressing uh, nicely. And um, just like uh, the Martin County presented today, we are uh, definitely seeing uh, the uptick in septic to sewer projects. And I want to commend the municipalities and the, the counties and the local folks, because you know, the starting with the homeowner uh, through the years, and it was uh, mentioned you know, just five years ago, the, the, the hurdles of um, you know, getting people to accept change and, and get on the grid, so to speak. So um, tremendous uh, job there, and, and uh, you know, I definitely want to give a shout out to our uh, water restoration assistance program, uh, people that actually get the partnership going uh, for a lot of these projects, and um, we're proud that they're able to get our logo onto some of these projects and that we can be affiliated with your guys' good work uh, in that. And, um, and then, that goes all the way down to our regulatory uh, arm, uh, like in our district, of you know, keeping us busy with processing those collection uh, permits, the wastewater plant renewals, and the upgrades to also treat uh, the water better there and, and as well. So uh, pretty much you know, all that uh, in, in every bit of our different sectors of DEP uh, all working together and keeping us busy and I'm thankful for it. So that, that means that uh, there's progress and forward momentum. So um, good stuff, that's all I get. That's great, it's great to hear. Commissioner Adams. Yeah, so I'm just gonna have a hard time following all that. <laughs> uh, um, just a couple things going on in Indiaver County. Uh, the septic to sewer project in Roseland that I'm always talking about is finally um, breaking ground and that's moving forward. So really excited about that. Um, hopefully next time I'll be able to say it's substantially complete, but I'll continue to update you guys until it's done. Um, and then we are actually having some conversations on a commission level with some of our uh, partners in the community, some of our larger property owners and different districts regarding um, some future stormwater, possibly stormwater improvements or large scale water um, supply issues and, and stormwater treatment and storage and those types of things. So hopefully we'll have some exciting news to bring back in the future about um, next steps beyond septic to sewer. So other than that, all is well as in Indian River County and it's always good to have you guys join us here. Great. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. My turn. I'll be short-winded. I know everybody <laughs> wants to go home. I just wanted to say that um, we just completed our 50th 5-0 um, Indian River Lagoon cleanup project. That's great. And with our funds that we get from our half-cent sales tax. Um, and we just awarded the Indian River Isles Septic to Sewer project, which is 143 homes being converted to um, sept, uh, sewer, they're right on the Indian River Lagoon, and I used my ARCA, ARPA funds to complete that project. We were about $2 million short. And that was a long story that, as you all probably know, costs are going up for everything. Yes. Well, we anticipated the cost of this project was going to be about $6.1 million, and the St. John's River Water Management gave us a million dollar grant, which was set to expire October 1st. Uh, we only had one bidder. He came in at about $8 million, and that was a problem because we didn't have that much budgeted. Um, and the St. John's River Water Management grant being expiring on October 1st presented a problem. So I went to them and they said that they would be gracious enough to expand, extend that for 90 days, which would buy us some breathing room. However, the contractor realized that he may not be making as much money as he thought he was gonna make on this, 
because of his rising cost, he opted to exercise his opt-out, which really put us in a squeeze because we didn't have any extra time. So thank God for ARPA, and I used that to bail the project out, so we just awarded that contract. So we're moving right along in Brevard County. Great. Doug? Yeah. Um, a couple things. One, uh, going back to Jackie's comments about how important the reconnection of the districts uh, is. When Dwayne DeFries called me to brief me, as he does with everybody before our meeting, uh, when we get done talking about surfing, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I said, Dwayne, of all the things that you know, of all the tools that we, we could do to save this lagoon, what is the most important project we could do? And he said, without a doubt, the number one is the reconnection of the district, districts because it's the biggest volume of water up to 200,000 acre feet, which is six inches on Lake Okeechobee. It's a lot of water. Um, so uh, that was interesting for Duane, who I think is, is one of the best resources we could ever hope to have uh, uh, running this, this organization. We've been so blessed to have him. Um, and that was, I, I always felt that was an important project, but Dwayne feels it's the number one thing we can do for the health of this lagoon and the animals in the lagoon. So uh, I've met recently with the St. John staff to ensure they're moving forward with Jackie's staff. I was down there two days ago with Jackie's staff, uh, and they assured me they're going to have the, the the right meetings to put together the entities and the right way to pump this water and move this water into the upper basin of the St. John's where we can use it and we can bleed it back into uh, St. Lucie and Martin County as needed. Um, it, it's a win-win for everybody. So um, I just want to let everybody know that I wanted to compliment Jackie for, for her comments. And, and we are fully supportive and then also I wanted to make sure that uh, Drew Bartlett knew we were going to continue our momentum with this because uh, Dr. Ann Shortell has just let us know at our board meeting on Tuesday she is going into retirement. Oh my goodness. Um, and it was a complete surprise to me and the governing board, uh, but she is at a stage in her life where she wants to go smell the roses with her husband and travel the world. So I tried to talk her out of it, but her logic was too sound to do so. <laughs> I couldn't argue against that because I want to do the same damn thing. But in any event, so we're going to see a new executive director soon up there. Uh, she retires September 9th. And I've already got seven phone calls from people wanting the job, and, and all of them are excellent. So we'll be looking at new EDs uh, or a new ED up there. So. In any event, uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Doug. And I'll give you a, a brief update from Martin County. And when Keith was speaking earlier on the Brevard Zoo, um, it made me think of Florida Oceanographic just recently um, did the ribbon cutting and completed their eco um, center. And if you haven't been there, it gives you a reason to come to Martin County. It's amazing. It's an educational um, center, educating on the lagoon. They also have a um, meeting space. And if you go up to the top of that facility, you can see views from the lagoon to the beach. It's absolutely amazing. Jackie, you attended the ribbon cutting too. It's a phenomenal asset, I think. And um, they're doing great work on educating on the lagoon. So definitely come visit us in Martin County, um, the Florida Oceanographic Eco Center as well. And on Monday, just recently, the Army Corps selected the CC plan for LOSUM. So um, Martin County um, was certainly pleased. We felt like over um, the last 50 years or so, if that CC plan was in place, then, you know, there are very little um, discharges that we would have received in the lake. So um, we'll continue to work with the Army Corps and all the stakeholders. And we want, just want to wish, by the time we meet next time, Colonel Kelly will be um, off, I believe, in September. Um, he will be ending his tenure and um, want to just send him the best wishes. And he, that's a tough job. And he's done a remarkable job um, working with all those groups. 
and um, Commissioner Zadowski, I find that um, that dredge project really, you know, fascinating, and would love to come take a tour okay. once it's all um, set up. And with that, you know, um, it's um, it, it's it's really interesting. So good. And that's all I have for today for Martin County. And our um, next meeting will be November 19th here in this um, City of Sebastian Chambers from 9.30 to 12.30. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>